Peace and love and welcome back, everybody. Peace and love. And welcome back to everybody in the building. How y'all doing today? Let's start with a mic check. Let's drop a one if you if I'm sounding good on you guys in. And we got something powerful for y'all today. <laughs> welcome back. We are here today with none other than our favorite person to stream with, baby. Jason Brashears, Archaics in the house. Um, I don't have to give a big intro because you guys know his work speak for itself. He's here today to talk to us about the Great Pyramid, and I'm just going to be here to add in where I see necessary and ask him a couple questions. As always, this will be another epic stream. With no further ado, let me let him go ahead and give his introduction and, and you know, go ahead and, you know, speak to the people. So salutes, Jason, and thank you once again for being here. We really appreciate you over here. Okay, Jason, uh, my bad. Your mic is muted. Salutes to everybody in the building and the people from Archaics. Salutes to you guys for sure. There we go. Okay, How, how's my audio now? There you go. There we go. We good to go. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's always a blast. Yeah. I know... Uh, I kind of took a page out of your book recently, and some of my lives have gone real, real long. They love them. They can't, you know, it's not a lot of people that's doing, like, meticulous, intricate, like, research and stuff like this um, and doing it live uh, regularly like we doing. So people, man, you know, it's a lot of people that drive trucks, truckers and all that. They love the live they love the long streams. Let me thank y'all guys for the echo. We turned the echo off now. That I had the speakers on with the headphones, but now we're good to go. Yes, yeah, salutes. I'm gonna pass it back to you, uh, Jason. If you want to give an introduction on what you came to talk to us today about, and then I'm gonna hop into some of the photos that you got for me, and and uh, you know just whatever you got for us, and I have some questions of my own. Oh, well, I mean, Great Great Pyramid is one of my passions. Yeah, one of my my very first published book, the reason it was published, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, is because I brought so much material from so many divergent sources, different cultures, time. You're basically, basically, I told material from different timelines, different epics of history, where they were all admitting that the pyramid was older than them. I mean... Uh, a lot of my material came from the Arabic texts, all uh, from you know 900 years ago to a thousand years ago. Even the uh, Islamic scholars were they were perplexed, and they had concluded that the Great Pyramid must have been a pre-flood structure because had it been built after the flood, then there would have been an accurate history about it, and not a bunch of speculation, not a bunch, not a bunch, not a bunch of just. Uh, pseudo pseudo historical texts that have been thrown out there that have absolutely nothing to back them and i, I believe one of the images i sent you was just it's it's uh, uh about the discovery of a fossil on the giza plateau oh uh, that's nothing that's nothing there's you know in the 1700s frederick norton lewis surveyed the site when the pyramids were still half buried before napoleon's engineers even had a chance to excavate the sphinx and frederick norton lewis notice before the French army came and cleaned the whole area up, he noticed that the entire area around the Great Pyramid was buried in seashells and in fossils. And uh, uh, this is Frederick Nord Norton Lewis, and you don't hardly hear about this guy ever, especially in pyramid books. And I got a bunch of them. Well, it's, it's what I research. Like this one right here, Origin and Significance of the Great Pyramid. This book is packed with all the Arabic and ancient Egyptian Coptic references. Anything that is found in any Arabic scholar's text since, since the advent of Islam and all the Egyptian Coptic material is in, is in this one book. It's packed. And the conclusion of the entire book, there's about 40 different references from ancient texts, and they all say the Great Pyramid is pre-cataclysm. And that it has nothing to it has nothing to do with with any civilizations after that cataclysm 
And you know what? I, I have to totally agree with you. I think it's pre-cataclysm. But me personally, I don't think the flood actually represents liquid water. I think it's this the same concept of the phenom, uh, phoenix phenomena to where you have this expansion of the pole energy and that destroys all of the systems. I believe that and I think you subscribe to this, too, that this simulation have been destroyed and rebuilt several times. But the people in life never really go anywhere because when the world in, it don't mean the earth in. It just mean the systems that we interact with from day to day in our life. They they leave like when this happens again, everything using electricity won't be functionable. So most of the world today rely more on electricity than they did back in the day. So it's going to be an apocalyptic event in our time. Um, I think this is what is meaning by these great recess where we have to rebuild the energy grid every time this aurora borealis expand because during the phenom. Phoenix phenomena, they saw the aurora borealis worldwide. That's amazing to me. And I do think that the pyramids, pre they they the only things around the world that's standing the test of time uh, with these resets. And I don't uh, really know if it's really water or not. I'm still uh, researching on that. But I'd like to hear you speak more on it. That'll bring more insight. Well, I mean, it's, it's like with, with anything, we uh, if we're going to learn anything about anything, mm -hmm. then we have we have to bring a lot of schools of thought to the table. And the reason we're at the, the stunted, arrested development part that we have found ourselves in today is because academia has employed the at the absolute opposite practice. They have rigidly compartmentalize every branch of science so there's no cross no cross communication mm -hmm. now paleontologists have absolutely no idea what the latest finds in geology and geologists don't know what's going on in paleobotany and the paleobotanists have absolutely not a clue of what's going on in theoretical physics Theoret theoretical theoretical physics scientists don't know anything, and nor do they think it's even applicable to understand anything that's going on in just basically adva advanced and applied mathematics. They, there's nothing. They have so rigidly compartmentalized all the different schools of thought that the lack of communication has completely retarded our ability to understand the, the past. And this is the value of independent researchers like you and I, uh, um, so there's there's others out there like stellium seven and i don't i don't mean to name a few to exclude the many you already know youtube and many other platforms there are hundreds of researchers out there whether they only have 600 subscribers or if they have 600,000 subscribers there are many different people trying to find the truth and the only way to do this is to look at all these different schools of thought L look look at the same phenomena from multiple different vantage points and then we start to learn something so this is the practice. This is the the practice that I employ. And if I'm going to study, if I'm going to study the Great Pyramid, then I've, I've had to go into I've had to go into great depth studying just ancient architectural building building the building craft. Mm -hmm. I've got whole books on art on architecture, architecture from the Middle Ages. I have I have I have one book on my shelf on on ancient Egyptian architectural techniques and the difference between Mesoamerican architectural techniques and just. Studying studying the tangential material actually allows us to see with more clarity just how mysterious the Great Pyramid is. There's nothing normal about this structure. This structure here is not just some pyramid. You know, the word pyramid has become so normalized that people automatically assume that any pile of rocks that vaguely looks like a hill is a pyramid. And they 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 assume that some of the things that are found in Mexico are technically pyramids when it's admitted by Mexican archaeologists that, like the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan, is is gigantic. It has more mass than the than the Great Pyramid. But the problem is, is archaeologists have already tunneled into it in multiple from the east and the in the north uh, 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 faces, and they've gone through it and they have confirmed that it's at least six substructures. That's not a true pyramid. 
that is one civilization building upon the ruins of, uh, of an older civilization. And then centuries go by, major earthquakes, volcanism, Phoenix phenomenon, flooding, whatever happens, collapse of a vapor canopy. A new civilization moves in 220 years later. They start building 500 years later. There's a whole new pyramid there, and nobody knows that three pyramids are underneath it. We don't have that in Egypt. We don't have that. We have that in Mesoamerica. Oaxia. We have that in Veracruz state. We have that in central Mexico. We have pyramids built on top of pyramids built on top of older structures, but they're all newer. The most ancient pyramids in the world are in Egypt and they're well, singular. Well, you know, structures. what about what about the photos that people got with them restructuring the pyramids in Giza and the Great Pyramid in the early 1900s, late 1800s? There are a lot of photos online where people say the pyramids in Egypt were recently built. I'm going to have to kind of be 50-50 on this one, Jason, because my research showed me that they want everybody to glorify the Egyptian pyramids, but actually there was nothing really special about Egypt. What the Egyptians knew was coming in their time around the whole world, which is why we can see these type of pyramided structures all over the place, even in Angkor Wat, Cambodia. And I think that it was universal knowledge at, at some point. And uh, it's just that we are... Focusing on the Egyptians, you know, we got the pyramid on the back of our dollar. But I think that there are great pyramid structures all over the world. Uh, some just as, as 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 marvelous as the one is in Egypt. But I really think it's a it's really hard to date this stuff because of all the resets and because of carbon dating being flawed and um you know fossilization being questionable. But I do think that what was important to focus on is the technology that the pyramids presented, because I have proof that they were subtle energy devices and that they were used to actually transmit the consciousness out of the body, which is what the Pharaoh was speaking about, uh, beaming his spirit to, I think, Orion or something like that. But. That's that's a very interesting concept of what they was used for, because it's different things that I, I think you would like to share, too, on that topic. But I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of 50 50 on just being um, straight up Egypto uh, like based. I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to see a lot of brilliant structures all over and some like the Pyramid Kukulkan, it actually makes a serpent on the side every time the sun set to symbolize the Kundalini rising up the central nervous system. This was an ancient religious system that even Moses partaked in, which is why he had the serpent staff. That's the spinal cord with the Kundalini energy going up. That's They all knew about the central nervous system, the simulation that we're in. I think that it would have been coming but I'm I'm not I'm not saying I'm right or wrong I'm just open ears and everybody hit the like button I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Jason well the the high antiquity of the Egyptian pyramid I'm only saying Egyptian because that's where it's located no Egyptians built that structure that structure was there long mm. before an Egyptian civilization so uh, Egypt, Egypt is only a geographical reference so people can differentiate between I'm talking about the Giza structure as opposed to any other pyramids in the world. Now, the, the, the issue we have is that for those who want to claim that the Great Pyramid is Egyptian, they have many hurdles they need to cross. One of them is a 450 mile hurdle. In the ancient world, empires did not span 450 miles. Sumer, Akkad, Mitanni, Urartu, uh, um, of Mari, all these were different seats of empire in the ancient world, and yet they're only a couple hundred, hundred miles apart in the Tigris Euphrates Basin. The uh, Hittite Hattusis wasn't that far, far, as, far uh, as well. Look how close Israel is to, to uh, Philistia, Philistia on the edge of Egypt. So we have a problem with the fact that. The ancient Egyptian pharaohs buried their nobility and their pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. Well, the Valley of the Kings is located in ancient Waset. That's where Karnak and Thebes are located. That's where Dendera is located. This southern Egypt, which is called Upper Egypt. Well, Upper Egypt has no pyramids. If you want to see pyramids, you have to go 400 miles north 
or you have to go an equal amount of distance south to Nubia to see the Nubian pyramids, which are very small compared to the ones in, in lower Egypt at the Egyptian Delta, known as Memphis, On, and Saqqara in, in Giza. So oh, there's many people, many people have this have this idea when they talk about ancient Egypt, they autom automatically think about pyramids, but the pyramid complexes were literally 400 to 450 miles away from all the Egyptian cities in Lower Egypt, which is Waset. So this, uh, this is the this is the land of, of Kemetia. Well, uh, uh, you you are, you already know Kemet. So mm -hmm. this uh, the high antiquity of the Egyptian pyramid was pretty much uh, known in the 1800s when these men. These books are from the 1800s here. When these men surveyed the Great Pyramid, this is from 1880 right here. These are the actual books from 1880, and this one's from uh, 1926. Engineer David Davidson is going over all the re 200 years of research on the Great Pyramids, and it was pretty much understood that a lot of pyramids are very new. When I mean new, within the last 2,000 to 3,000 years. But the Great Pyramid, the single Great Pyramid in Egypt that is 454 feet high and is made with technolithic precision and like you said it was a technological device it was it was not primitive at all it is the original pyramid by which all other civilizations tried to copy later and they added like you said Kukulkan. in my book i discuss a whole chapter about the cultural additions that were added to these pyramids when they for this cataclysm Every individual group took their knowledge of the pyramid and what it stood for, and they went to their different areas of the world. They're trying to survive. They're building their cities. The first thing they do is they, they measure out areas for their own personal pyramid based off the, the super civilization that they were a part of before the cataclysm. And when they build these, they add all these new imaginative and new scientific and new cultural attachments that are very unique in Oaxia. Very unique at Pinotichlin. The pyramids in Mexico are very small, except for the Pyramid of the Sun, which has more mass than the one in the Great Pyramid, but it's four to five different structures built over a 2,000 year period. That's a bunch of rubble and filler. Most people don't don't make the difference. They don't understand a pyramid is a solid it's a solid structure of masonry. And what's at Giza is unparalleled. It's 203 levels of blocks that are two and a half tons that go all the way up 454 feet. And they were faced in 100 inch thick limestone casing blocks that, like I sent you those images that Herodotus and Strabo and Ammianus, Marcellinus, all of them wrote about uh, the Great Pyramid. It wasn't even climbable. It was too smooth before the earthquakes in 1356 to 1402 and the Muslim instruction engineers began taking all that good rock off that because they needed ballast for roads. They built the, the, uh, the, uh, what is it? The Sultan Osan's palace and, and, uh, mosque. Can't remember. There's st several buildings in Cairo were made for, yeah. was made from the material. And, yeah. but it's, but you're right. It was a technological device, and it was, and they tried to mimic it uh, in South America too, at Tiwanaku, at Puma Punka, uh, uh, San Kuniathan. There's different places where yeah, they let had... me let me speak to that. I totally disagree that they tried to mimic it in in South America, and I think that what we're missing here is the fact that during the time the pyramids were built on Earth. There wasn't no such thing as South America, Egypt, these map boundaries that we're looking at today. There was a one world order of universal knowledge and everybody understanding this stuff at one time. So like you said, the people we call in the Egyptians wouldn't have even built that pyramid. It would have been an advanced race of humans that predate the flood and before the type of uh uh, humans that we even are today mentally on, on a mental level, they would have knew way more than, than our society. But what I'm saying is they would have been so advanced. They wouldn't have had, they didn't have like 
national boundaries and like the concept of your knowledge or my knowledge or copywriting information. It the knowledge that we're finding out now, Jason, it was universal. There was nobody trying to hide it. A lot of people like to say, well, the, the Egyptians had a mystery system and they were a bunch of Freemasons trying to hide the knowledge from people and people stole the knowledge from them. But I'm saying no one had to steal it. The people were calling the Egyptians would have freely given you the knowledge. They wouldn't have been called the Egyptians either. It would have been in a world where this type of knowledge just would have been, it wouldn't have been occult or mystified. It would have been universal. I can also show the concept of pyramids uh, in, in South America during the time of the Olmecs. And we know that the Egyptians weren't around during the time of the Olmecs. This is a colossal Olmec head mounted on top of a pyramid because it's symbolizing the soul, the pharaoh of the soul beaming out the top of his pyramid. One of the, one of the uh, uses for these pyramids would have been spiritual technology, like it would have been to bring the Pharaoh peace, as he call it, where he could project his soul through through the natures, which is why we see the beam at the top. We see the uh, the uh, symbol for peace is right here with the pyramid, with the light of the Pharaoh of the central nerve, the consciousness that resides in the central nervous system. This would have had a lot of spiritual technology and implications of exiting the simulation, returning to the simulation, some sort of Stargate portaling technology that we're yet to uh, uncover in our time because we do not connect spiritually in our science. It's all physics and physical. But the concept of Jack leaving his cube, the Saturn's cube or the simulation, that was a religion. When we see Christ mounted on top of Calvary, that's how you get the jack in the box, which is an ancient uh, tradition of the soul breaking free from the simulation. And we can see this in Samaria and everywhere else. What I'm saying is that, that this was the original spiritual system on earth. Pyramid Pyramids represent the fact that our earth is, is shaped like a pyramid. Our earth is a huge pyramid, and the tip of that pyramid is in the center of the earth, the highest point in the universe that Mercator called Mount Maru. So all over, even in Plato, we see Plato has this step pyramid, this pyramid you refer to, Saqqara. That is the word chakra. Chakras are the layers of the self. Each, each, each of these multiverses, we have an avatar in it and we can move our consciousness to any of these layers of reality. The pharaohs and the Omex and all of them, they knew exactly what the Hindu knew when they made the avatars of Vishnu. Vishnu. We see, we, we think the word av avatar is new today, but it's an old ancient word dealing with this simulacrum, this simulation man you speak of. When you hear the word Saqqara, that's just another way to say chakra. And these pyramids would have been teaching devices, too. They would have been teaching about the layers of the atmosphere, the platonic realm, as we see here, octanism, and how light projects from the top down. People say that the pyramids were created from the top down. And the reason that people say that, because if you understand how an hourglass works, it creates the pyramid from the top down as time uh, uh, is being dispensed from Polaris, the center star, which would be this stream of sand. That's the beam stop. And so as that come, uh, uh, drops down, you have this concept of pyramids being created from the top down because the original, uh, the foundational element of this simulation is light. So everything below this light beam expands into the elements, which are fake, which are the simulation uh, experience and weight, physicality and all that stuff. So even these collages, and I'm going to end here, will, will sink all of this pyramid, uh, will sink the pyramid concept together. It really was an ancient spiritual system talking about how the soul exits this simulation until they hid that and tried to trap people here, not telling us that we're in a simulation. But um, I'm going to pass the mic back to you and hear what you have to say about that. Well, I'm, uh, I'm just, I get, I get what you're saying, and I understand the association. I feel like we're jumping, we're jumping from millennia to millennia. 
because my my understanding of the Great Pyramid from an architectural perspective goes to the third third millennium BC. From a spiritual perspective, I see how post cataclysm the pyramid was used to explain a lot of the things that you just said. It's all, uh, and all, uh, yeah. I think it, it would be a chronological. Yeah, it's 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 very. I get I get it. My mind, my mind doesn't process information that way. It's a, the way you just the way you just showed it in all these pictures. It's uh it's uh I'm very linear in my thinking. So uh, when I'm talking about one time period and we immediately jump a thousand something years, I have to it's hard for me to keep up sometimes. But yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. It's uh um so you don't so one thing one thing we have, you absolutely do not feel that the Great Pyramid of Giza is anything more than any other pyramids in the world? Is that I what think, I'm, is that? No, 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 no. I think that the Great Pyramid of Giza is bigger than any other pyramid in the world, and that's what makes it great in today's world because we think bigger is better. I actually think the concept behind the object is what makes it great or not. So if the Great Pyramid in, in Egypt is great because it was built in honor of the Pharaoh and, and uh, to be some sort of spiritual tomb for the Pharaoh, then it's a big, big old stacked up, uh, 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 big pile of ego. Whereas if the pyramid in, in South America may be smaller, but it had spiritual implications for the entire village to learn about the stars. It wasn't no one chief uh, being honored from it. So I look at that aspect, too. But everybody will decide what makes something great to them or not. Bigger is better to some people, but I'm not necessarily biting on that right off the bat. So, I mean, but, you know, I think it's great. We can never re rebuild a Great Pyramid today with all our technology to turn your nose up at it or be blasphemous. Uh, it'll be a smack in the face to the ancestors that built it. But I think it'll kind of be the same thing to put it on a pedestal just for the sake of it being big. Because in that case, we can say, well, Texas is the best state if it's just bigger. But that other smaller states got I agree. A, hey, yeah, yeah. a good you argument. Got you got it. That's a good argument. That's a good argument. But let's let's put aside for now any any thought of its dimensions and size. Let's just note one thing. There is one there's one thing about the Great Pyramid that no other pyramids in the world have replicated. None. There are many, many researchers have tried to find it. They cannot find there is one aspect. Do you know what the Muslims found? Al-Mamon, the Caliph of Baghdad, in the year 820 AD, when they tunneled into the Great Pyramid because they couldn't find the front entrance, do you, do you know what they found that made the Great Pyramid completely different than the other 136 pyramids in Egypt and all the pyramids in China, the pyramids all throughout, the two pyramids in, in Achaia, Greece, and all the pyramids of, of, of North and Central and South America? There's only one thing that makes the Great Pyramid different than all of them. And it's incontestable. And it's the fact that all the pyramids in the world replicate the descending. You can pull up a diagram of the pyramid and you can see the descending passage goes all the way down to a subterranean chamber that has a well pit. Yeah. This feature mm -hmm. this feature was copied in South America and Lucermata. It was copied multiple times throughout the Americas in Central and North America. All these pyramids have this descending passage, and it yeah. goes to an underground grotto in a well pit. Yeah, and that and that and that pit you talking about, Dante called it the inferno. I call it the upside down as well. This is why they built it. Let me show. See, there's a polarity aspect to the pyramid, the fact that we have, they give us this all the time. They will have this glacier floating in the water and at the top, and you will see a peak of the glacier sticking out the surface of the water. But if you look under the surface of the water, it's a whole nother uh, glacier pointed down, making a diamond. So under all of the pyramids, you will have another subterranean, actually an inverted pyramid going down and that's because they were symbolizing the, the, the universe just like the Hindu is showing here. The pyramid that's going down under the ground that's representing Sheol and the one at the top that's representing the base reality. This this 
the uh, this simulation holographic world is simply a reflection of the base reality like we see here. And the dielectric inertial plane is what separates the two. It acts as this sort of trans, this reflective layer, this or ether, if you will. And this is how the universe, from the base point, triples and doubles itself like a you going in a mirror house, uh, so to speak. But this symbol of Saturn here, the god of repetition, the one when they said we're burned, we're born like a CD, burning a copy of a CD. This Babel Tower concept is almost like a CD tower deck where we put the master copy on the top and, and make a bunch of copies from that one. But uh, the reason all of these pyramids around the world have that inverted part at the bottom is because they all were embodying the secrets of our uh, cosmology. I could show you other examples of this bottom shelf all around the world. It, it, to, to, to say that the Egyptians were the only ones aware of this is to say that the Egyptians were the only ones knew about the shape of the earth and the universe. But the Egyptians had Nut and Gab, and everybody else had their form of the firmament dome and a flat plane as well. Uh, I don't think that the Egyptians were the only ones in the world with the knowledge of why the pyramids are so great. The greatest pyramid in the universe, by the way, is in the middle of the earth. It's called Rupert's Nigra. It's so big is what the Bible talking about when they tried to build the uh, tower to the heavens. And all of our compasses are pointing to this thing. Uh, right now at zero degrees. This is from Mercator map. So our earth is like this huge uncapped pyramid. And when we get to the middle of it, the reason the pyramid ain't capped is because that is an exit point for energy. Just like I'm showing here, there's a guy named Robert Gulick, 2017. He patented this right here. And I, I need to look up more on this guy, but this is deep. This diagram shows how the, the pyramids can be used as subtle energy devices. And then I have artwork from the Mayans that, um, that kind of suggest that they use theirs for the same reason. These two vortexes that we see coming from the pyramid are the sun and the moon that are going around Mount Maru in the middle of the earth. And this is why they're creating the two particles at CERN. So it, these two particles are... Negative, positive, electro, electricity, magnetism, yin and yang to our ancestors, sun and moon. We couldn't, the, the simulation couldn't exist w without this knowledge of the pyramid. So it was very divine. The pyramid didn't have a capstone because a volcano doesn't have a capstone because something exit at that point. And um, I'm going to just... I'm going to leave this right here so we both sharing information with each other. I want everybody to hit the like and share button, and I'm going to fall back on the mic right there. Uh, can you pull up a diagram of the interior chambers of the Great Pyramid? Yeah, I got you. Those chambers lead to the uh, burial tombs, interior chambers. Oh, I don't believe that. I know that's a common theory, but I, I don't. I don't subscribe to that. Yeah, a lot of your uh, comet, comedic priests and all of them they subscribe to that. I don't blame you. Yeah. Right there, the first one's good. The one with the blue sky. That's good. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Oh. Uh, real simple. The the descending passage that you see that goes to the subterranean chamber is the feature that's been replicated in all the pyramids all over the world. But the ascending passage that goes up to the grand gallery, the queen's chamber, the antechamber, and then the king's chamber where the, where the empty box is, it's not a sarcophagus, but the empty box, no pyramid in the world replicates that. And I challenge anybody to find evidence of it. Researchers have been yeah. publishing books for 200 years on the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid at Giza, not built by Egyptians, but it's in what we call Egypt today. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the only pyramid in the world that has this feature of an ascending chamber system. And it's because in 820 AD, 
the Muslim caliph of Baghdad, Al Mamon, and his men tunneled into the Great Pyramid, and they were hammering so much that the vibrations dislodged a cleverly hidden ceiling block. The ceiling block fell, and they tunneled toward the sound and opened it up to a granite plug. There was three giant granite plugs that blocked access to this to this to this ascendant passage. It is the first time in recorded human history. No, no one had ever mentioned before that there was an ascendant ascending uh, a passage. No one had ever, no, 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 no Greek authors, Ammianus, Marcellus, Diodorus, Siculus, Herodotus, no one knew anything about the ascendant, and neither did all the pyramid builders all over the world. This is this is prima facie evidence that the Great Pyramid was, was built in the upper areas were hidden from the public. But when the public was made known, they were allowed to access to it. They went down the descending passage and they looked in the subterranean. They did all that. And then when they took that knowledge all over the world and built their own pyramid cities, they didn't, they didn't replicate the, the upper features because they didn't know about them. They had been completely sealed off. You know, this is, this is a this is what to me makes the Great Pyramid. That's just one fact that makes the Great Pyramid very, very different than all the other ones. Other that that's the other other facts concern measurements, rectilinear measurements done to a thousandth of an inch, inch by Egyptologists, and that have been widely published by Sir Flinders Petrie, show some amazing things. Now, I believe the Great Pyramid was built by machines. I believe it's technologically advanced. The civilization that built it was was as, was just as advanced as you say. There's no doubt. Not only did they have a technological sophistication, they were very spiritually mature as well. But after after that cataclysm, the people who built pyramids after that, I don't believe they had that level of sophistication. And that's why we don't have any other structures that are near that size and complexity, because it's very complex. When you're when you're dealing with with 2.5 tons and you have 2.5 million of these blocks to set, they all have to be laser tolerance perfect because you're because at, at Giza they applied an adhesive. This adhesive is one fiftieth of an inch thick. We don't even know what it is. The chemical compounds are still mysterious to us today. Christopher Dunn is a modern engineer who has been studying the Great Pyramid in the 1980s, 1990s, published a few books. He's even he's even perplexed about the geopolymer compounds that have been found all throughout the structure. The high, the the laser smooth tolerances, the uh, the uh, the boring that was done, like fracture quarrying, these things don't make sense to us today because we, when we look on the past, we see primitive people. You know, you already know how how the collegiate academic position is. A bunch of guys wearing robes and sandals were out there with copper hammers and copper chisels building all this stuff. It's absolutely untrue, but it's uh yeah so. Absolutely, I'm on board with the Great Pyramid being being uh it hints to a greater spiritual knowledge. There's no doubt, no doubt in my mind. But it was built by a civilization that was very, very advanced. And I don't even believe that we're as technologically advanced today as they were when it was originally constructed. And I believe it's because we're simply dumbed down. They're not giving us the knowledge that those guys would have had in their normal society. But I do want to say that the reason we don't find king's chambers or air shafts in the other pyramids is, I mean, they're king's chambers and queen's chambers. These pyramids in Egypt were built in honor of what they call lords pharaohs, uh, 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 high-ranking people in society. The ones in other places, they're just basically universal teaching monuments. So you won't see the same features on all of them. And I don't think that because one has a feature or lacks a feature, it makes it better. Because I'm not really that impressed with those ass chefs. I'm more impressed with the uh, serpent that shows during the spring equinox up the size, side of Kukukan. When we say that the Great Pyramid is so great because they they was hammering away in it and it they... they uh, it, it rumbled and then it, it uncovered these shafts. That mean um, it it that shows a lot about its sturdiness. If modern man can go in there with hammers and cause all of that rumpus to and, and cause something to be revealed that they wanted to hide, um, when this thing survived resets 
and it, it couldn't survive man hammering. So I think there's a lot to that. I also think that um, we want to marvel at the pyramids in Egypt deep inside because we've been taught to, you know, it's just our so society is Egypto crazy. Look at our money. Look at our obelisk in D.C. I mean, we so a, a lot of things we do today, we copy the Egyptians, but a lot of ancient societies didn't copy the Egyptians for their pyramid because we all originated from the North Pole. We all, the original humans on this earth would have all saw the greatest pyramid in the universe, and it wouldn't have been the one in Egypt. It would have been what Mercator put on his map. This is the only pyramid where our compasses point to. All of the magnetic ley lines point back to this pyramid. So this pyramid at the North Pole, it is supposed to be the, 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 uh, the tower to the heavens. If the original races, such as the pygmy that we see right here, who has the oldest knowledge of the universe, we still used Vedic astrology to predict things today, even in modern times. And the Vedics had pyramids in honor of Rupus Niger. We think everyone's copying the Egyptians, but the Egyptians is actually copying off what they saw at the North Pole, just like everyone else. Everyone took their hodge or their trip to the source point, to the zero degree point where all creation expand from. And what they saw there was a huge pyramid. And they went back to their lands and they built their own pyramids in their lands based on what's happening at the zero degree point. They're trying to make Egypt Eden. They're trying to make it like Egypt is the birthplace of all knowledge and civilization when actually all numbers, all time, all language and all knowledge comes from zero degrees and it is expanded outward. This is what gave birth to numbers, language and all of that. The true birthplace of the of, of where humans was the most enlightening, enlightened about the universe and the mechanisms that's working this simulation, that's where our compasses is pointing to. They're not pointing to Egypt. Now, Egypt did the same thing everybody else did. Because we weren't restricted to this pole area, we took we marveled at what we saw at the pole area, and we took that and we duplicated it everywhere we settled. That's just my interpretation. I don't like to think that the whole world was just stealing from Egypt um, because Egypt had universal knowledge that we find where everybody said that this knowledge comes from the center. And you we, you teach this too, Jason. You teach that this knowledge to go within, go to inside of the self, go inside of yourself. The center point is where I'm so showing now. And this is where the not you can't even be taught this knowledge. It's already in us and it just gotta be unlocked and activated. But this is this is just my interpretation. Like I said, um everyone went stealing from Egypt. It's just universal knowledge and people got different reasons why they think this pyramid is great or that pyramid is great. People call Alexander the Great. I don't think Alexander was great. I think he was a horrible racist murderer. Right. So I got the right to determine what's great or not to me. And if someone's trying to force me to think Alexander is great, it's an agenda behind it. That's what I actually believe but i'm gonna pass the mic for that yeah well he was definitely a psychopath there's no <laughs> doubt uh, i've read a lot about alexander of macedon before he didn't become alexander the great until he had already conquered about seven different armies and sat on the throne of babylon in 331 bc it was it was an ex post facto title they didn't call him alexander the great during that time it was a, it was later when they were writing the histories about him but i mean uh, he killed his best friend, Callisthenes, his uh, childhood friend, Callisthenes, who went on all his campaigns with him uh, just because they had philosophical differences. They 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 processed information differently. Man. They saw the world differently. And uh, Callisthenes is, is awesome. His writings and the things that have been preserved about him are smart as hell. He decoded the old Babylonian star system and realized they were talking about days and uh, published this material. This uh, Callisthenes did that. You know, you know, you know, I'm a critic of Zechariah Sitchin. You know, 432,000 yeah. days long and all that. Well, Callisthenes in 330 years BC had already decoded and, and knew that the Babylonian cuneiform was not talking about years. 
the Anunnaki didn't live 57,000 years until the next king ruled. It wasn't that it was 57,000 days, which which ends up being like a 40 year period. And it made sense. Callisthenes figured it all out. But Alexander ended up murdering him, but uh, killing his best friend, only friend he ever had. That is crazy. And they, and they got a Napoleon movie out, by the way, too. I got it going. Check that out. Um, salutes to everybody in the chat room. Uh, if, if we have time at the end, we, we can let people actually come up and ask questions or say whatever they want to say. Um, I got to ask you a, a question that uh, one of your uh, people from Archaics came on. Well, actually, they booked a meeting with me. Salutes to them. And um, they were saying, Brother Sanchez, do you believe that the world is going to end in 2040? And I was like, no, what are, you, what are you talking about? He was like, well, Jason teaches that the world is going to end in 2040. I want you to be able to speak to that out of your own mouth and give the people what you uh, have on the year 2040. And, and I'm going I'm to mute my mic. Go ahead. You got well, first of all, it's a it's a uh, it's an oversimplification and a and a, and a complete misquote. Never on, in my published books, never on my channel have I ever said the world is going to end in 2040 mm. at all. But 2040 is definitely the next Phoenix reset reset date. And the Phoenix phenomenon, the 138 year periodicity, is another reason why I believe the Great Pyramid in Giza. It's different than every other pyramid in the world because the scientific measurements inside and out are divisible by 138. And I've got hundreds of charts that show this. And this is one of the things that on my channel that I it took an entire playlist called the Lost, the Lost Secrets of Giza to show all this material because it's unbelievable. There's no other pyramid in the world that has so many rectilinear measurements within and without that are all equally divisible perfectly by the number 138. And it's inexplicable. No one in academia has yet tried to try has yet done an explanation of this. So it's not it's not it's not the only thing. Uh, it's not the only time that pyramids associate to the number one thirty eight. There's a pyramid in Mexico that has one hundred and thirty eight dragon heads, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the, uh there's another uh, pyramid in Mexico that's exactly one hundred and thirty eight feet high, feet high, but that could be that could be total coincidence. But but what I'm saying is 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 there's a lot of people who uh I'll give you an example. Any person, any person of average intelligence can walk into a grocery store and they can go down one aisle and then they can walk out of that grocery store and they can give anybody an opinion about what they think about that whole grocery store based off their limited perception of just looking down that one aisle. This is what a lot of people, this is what a, a lot of people. Uh, who don't know what they're talking about when they come into my house? When they come into Archaics, they they get triggered and they come and they come into contact with a lot of data that they've never heard for before. But they don't want to do the work and they don't want to see how this information was derived and what the sources are. They don't want to pull a calculator out. So what they'll do is they'll go to other people and ask them, "What do you think about it? Jason did or this?" And they'll misquote me. And mm. no one has ever heard. No one has ever heard me say. The world is going to end in 2040. But I do get that a lot. I get, I get that a lot is because people come in, they watch two or three videos, and then they think all of a yeah. sudden they're an expert in archaics. You they right. think they're an expert in all things that took me a lifetime to achieve. So I get that a lot, bro. I get it a lot, and I, I just don't care. It's a, I'm, I'm, I'm so yeah. glad I asked you that because um, it's more than one person did that, and it's they saying – in the world but you're saying reset phoenix phenomena that is totally different and to say in a world is kind of trying to make jason like one of those dooms doom dooms dayers <laughs> jason they to add to it, <laughs> yeah you know what it's like bro we can even add to it it's all i've only in the last two and a half years widened my information footprint to the point that a lot of people are now becoming familiar with the data but the truth of the matter is the 2040 date was first published by me in a magazine in 2004. And all I have done is found more and more information to where I now I got three published books about it and about a hundred videos. So it's a, uh, this has never deviated even way before the 2012 bullshit 
I was calling 2012 bullshit. I even have a book published called Anunnaki Homeworld where I was calling all those authors out for bullshit. That nothing was going to happen in 2012 because the Mayan law count does not end then. You know, they're adding, they're using a different modern calendar trying to impose it on an ancient culture. That's not, you have to go by Mayan mathematics. If you don't go by Mayan mathematics, you're not going to produce the out output that the Maya intended. And this is what the scholars did in 1952. They effed up. And then they didn't want to admit that they had made a mistake by crossing two different systems. And they got everybody, the whole publishing world, to agree that, oh, okay, look, man, my law account's gonna gonna end in 2012. And none of those books, none of those authors are even around anymore. I think there's only one author from that period that has actually survived the blowback, and that's Graham Hancock. But the rest of them just kind of fell off into disrepute. Nothing ever happened, especially that guy, Jose or guy Agayas or whatever his name was. He was the Mayan factor. He was really pushing that real hard. And then when 2013 came around, my, my book's already been out for two years, but nobody's reading Jason. No one knows me because I'm still in prison. My publisher was the only one putting my book out there. So the archaics material has only become popular in the past two years, but it actually goes back goes back to 2004, 2006 when my first book published to about 2010 when my publisher published my, my third book. So a lot of people coming into contact with this data, they get triggered because it's so different and they think I'm just somebody reporting something about the future and uh, they don't understand that all this research was done in the 1990s. My bibliographic citations have been public for everybody to download for free to see where I got all this data. So, but they knew people come into contact with this information and, and they think, oh, it's another doomsayer, another another guy doing it. No, man, it's been, it's been 20, it's been almost 20 yeah. years. I have never changed the date. I don't need to because there's, there's overwhelming amount of sources, even independent, even totally independent of the 138 year chronology of the Phoenix phenomenon we still can see 20, 20, 40 as being the next date. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be it's going to be a date. I believe the return of the vapor canopy. I believe that volcanoes all around the world in 2038 and 2039 are going to be are going to be spewing so much from underneath the ocean, turning churning that so, I'm just turning these these salinated waters in, into the sweet water of the sky and the volcanic ash in the pumice. I believe it's going to be very very rapid. Very, it's going to. It's, it's happened very rapid in the past. I believe very, very rapidly we're going to find we're going to find ourselves in the same situation that four prior civilizations have all documented. It's called the death of the sun, and it's because the sky darkens and stays dark for a very long period of time. Bill Gates. Okay. Come again. Come again. That remind me of what Bill Gates trying to do with technology. But yeah, you get. It's just dawned on me. You got it. He trying to black oh, yeah. out the sun. Yeah. No, that's yeah, that's yeah. I, I anything the media, anything the media promotes, I pretty much believe the exact opposite. I don't follow anything <laughs> in modern media. I don't want to hear about solar flare activity. I don't want to hear about well anything coming across ABC, NBC, CBS, mainstream media. If anybody cites a NASA source, I can't even take them seriously. I can mm. only take seriously the very things I can verify. I live here on Earth. I've never been in a golf cart wrapped in aluminum foil riding around the moon. So I will never agree that we've been there. It is not a part of my personal experience. Common, se common sense to me dictates we couldn't have never made the trip in 1969. But, we, but, but common sense also dictates that by 1969, the intelligence apparatus was so firmly fixed in America that, that an intelligence psyop could have definitely been pulled off on the majority of the employees in NASA, which would have sold it to the American people as well. So I don't know, man. I'm just, hey, I'm not, I don't mean to, I don't mean to say that I'm right. I'm just in my reality, there's a lot of things that are just absolute bullshit and they've never happened mm -hmm. before. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. So uh one one other thing that I would bring up was um okay, I think that's everything you know on my list actually now that I'm looking at it. We can uh bring people on. I think one thing I was gonna pick your mind about was the moon. Um but I don't wanna, you know, get into we don't have to get into that if you don't want to, because 
I, I think you teach that the moon uh, is was recently brought here, and I've been I debated a lot of people on that, saying that you know the moon always been here, but we don't got to get into that. Well, uh, well let me right hold on, let me let me let me clarify mm -hmm. so you know exactly where I'm coming from. Yeah, so, no problem. In my chronological research, the moon appeared for the first time in the year four thousand and thirty nine B.C. There were many. There were there were cultures in all in our in our world, and they remember this. And some of them considered themselves as pre selenite meaning they took great pride in the fact that they were here before the moon appeared. This is in this is in the research of, of Hans Boringer, Hans Bellamy. It's quoted by uh, uh, it's quoted and added to by Emmanuel Velikovsky that the moon is recent. When we say recent, we're speaking from a uniformitarian perspective, meaning it could still be four or five thousand years ago. Because 4,039 B.C. was still way over 6,000. It's, it's over 6,000 years ago. So to me, that's recent. That's 6,000 years ago, the moon appeared. And uh, um, according to a lot of mystical traditions, tradi it was like the, like the Arabic traditions, the jinn appeared when the moon appeared. In, other tra in, in, in occult traditions, we have demons appeared when the moon appeared. See, and this... Uh, in, this in, in, this is when I, I lead a room and I say, OK, we're approaching, you know, that kind of mystic pseudo area. You know, it's because um, the oldest symbol on Earth, and this is no, no joke, the oldest symbol on Earth is the yin yang. It's the oldest spiritual s symbol on the planet, the yin yang symbol. And consistent around the world now the yin yang is sun and moon so if that's the oldest sim spiritual s symbol on earth they got to show me just a, a time where it was just a yin symbol without the yang because there's a lot of uh pair deities that complement each other that personify the sun and moon that go back further than the date that they said they first saw the moon. To me, that's a lot of hearsay, but I don't think it's nothing um, we see. I don't think we can even live without the moon. If it, 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 it governs a lot of serotonin and all of that stuff. Both of them playing a roles like the earth is a battery and you need a negative and positive man and woman, sun, moon, polarity. To, to me, if the moon didn't exist, Polarity didn't exist during that time on Earth. And that was probably one set, one this, one. Because this the moon is in direct relation to its own energy on Earth, uh, the feminine, and the sun is the masculine. But that's just my understanding. But I think both of us, given our understanding together, the people who benefit is the people in the chat room. So y'all hit the like button and salutes to Jason for his time. You got it, Jason. Yeah, the uh, I don't know anything about the yin yang symbol being old. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen an old depiction of it. I know um, we're talking about six thousand years though, and writing writing from the human perspective, from the anthropological perspective, there are no examples of human script and writing beyond thirty five thir the thirty fifth century BC. So if that's true, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying that's what's published by academia that. Human writing, writing systems, they came after the Kwipu. The Kwipu was the knot communication, using strings for, for knots and all that, and told to knife, cut it, cutting on wood, the, the first, you know, where symbols began, told, totem societies. But if, if writing and script uh, only dates to the 35th century BC, and, and then it was all proto, it was very, very primitive. From which later Chinese hieroglyphic and later Sumer Sumerian developed from. If that's true, then the moon would still have appeared 530 years before that. So, uh, my, I don't know. But but to me, you have to understand. You you mentioned the moon, but I believe the entire stellar sky, the whole entire stellar sphere, is simulated. I don't believe the moon is physical at all. I don't believe it's a physical me object neither. that me NASA neither. that NASA could have landed on. I yep. it, it's uh it puts off a very odd light. I know you've done some research on that. The, the light of the moon is very different than the light of the sun. Well, uh, yeah, does. yeah, I've done research on it. It 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 uh it uh 
what you call it. It uh, inspires serotonin from the body. When the moon, when we're under the moonlight, our body start to produce a hormone called serotonin. Uh, that's what it does. It's like a mellow energy. But yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's all. To me, to me, it's just simulated. It's part of it's part of the story of the sky, you know. Just like we're we're li every single historical epic that we live through is a story. It's background. The only thing important are the souls that are passing through it. Uh, during the Roman epic, the Romans weren't weren't important. It was all the immortal souls that were passing through that epic. The Ro Roman period was just background. The Greek period was just background. You know. The, the Persian period, which is one that one of the most ignored by historians, the Persian period, the Achaemenid period, all this, all the Saka period, these were all just background to the story that is the immortal experience. Man, that's why I believe I believe we're living through programmed routines, and that all uh, it's all it's all programming, and we've probably been through it multiple times in these in these bodies that we know are called avatars, and uh. I just to me to me there's no mystery anymore. To me it all it's all very synthetic. It's all and there's clues as to what may have happened on the outside. Maybe we're running simulations for an objective. Maybe we're trying to discover something. Maybe this is all about spiritual development and the simulation is so detailed packed with enigmas and mysteries as to keep it interesting while we're here because the detriment is truly waking up. Once, once a significant population wakes up that they're in an artificial construct, what do you think? The, what do you think the next move is? Is it a general awakening that causes and triggers every reset? Why mm. are there resets? Why are there periods of arrested development that follow these resets? I mean, in the historical record, we look back and we call things the Great Black Death plague. We call things the Dark Ages. But mm. what is it that happened that caused that to, to occur? Why was why in a period of great stability and population blooming and engineering and development in the sciences and the arts and religion and everything, all of a sudden something happens and we begin a period called the Dark Ages. The great Mediterranean Dark Ages, another period almost totally ignored by historians. They focus on they focus on the the after effect, which was the invasion of the sea peoples. But there's the, there's so many enigmas throughout the historical record. But the more that I the more that I research these things, the more I find out it's all background programming. And the only thing really important here is you and I. And that we we can quibble over all the details ad infinitum. But the only thing really important out of this entire experience is, is where we're going, what we're doing. We're immortal beings, and none of this is really important. It's not. But you're going to get mainstream media to try to convince you that everything is detrimental everything is something to 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 worry about everything is something to vibrate on a lower frequency about everything is everything is is bad for you everything is, everything that you want for yourself is being stepped from you the mainstream media is toxic and it gets you to do the exact opposite of what just natural searching would do i don't believe the discovery of information is paramount I believe what's important is the search because that's how somebody wakens up. It doesn't matter how much data you have in your head. All that really matters is that you are searching because as long as you are in a state of searching, that implies that you believe there is something greater to be found. And if that's the case, I believe the oversoul can use an individual like that. Can't, oversoul, has, can't, you, oversoul just can't use anybody who's stuck in the collective. Somebody who's not searching, somebody who who thinks that this world is actually real, and that all this weird, bizarre phenomena that goes around us is is actually a part of the reality that they're passing through. Those those are the ones stuck in the construct. They loop back over and over and over. I don't believe that's who we are. Not those of us who are awakening. Those of us who are awakening are realizing there's cracks in the holosphere, and we're seeing through them. And I believe that that is prima facie evidence that this is probably our last run through here. I don't mean to get all preachy. I don't know no, why. I don't no, no, they. I love it when you when you get in your bag like that. I love it, yo, uh, because it's nothing but real talk right there. That was a good point you made about uh, even if a person's searching and they still ain't found it yet, that they still in a state of a place of being woke. 
Because being woke is really knowing that there's something out there greater than what we've been taught. Whether you find it or not, that's a different topic. But just knowing that creates the search and that you you woke just knowing that. That's that's a good point, though. Like, you know, and a person like that can be used if they because they have an open mind. That was really awesome. I got to drop a bomb with that, though. I ain't going to lie. Yeah, y'all say uh, Jason be preaching. Yo, Reverend Jason, man, I would go to his church. I would gladly tithe. You know what I'm saying, man? But salutes to uh, Jason. I'm going to let some people come up and pick Jason's brain. You know what I'm saying? This, this Every time me and him hook up, it's a classic. If you got anything you want to say as far as the Great Pyramid, any particular slides you want me to show in particular before I let the people up uh yeah we could do that now as well and oh we man your people always ask awesome questions you can go and kick it off okay yeah they do that's why i'm gonna go i'm i'm, I'm opening up the gates y'all i'm gonna drop the call link again yeah i know y'all gonna come with the five questions salutes to all of y'all man there we go come on up y'all like and share the video while you're at it. Who we got on the call? Okay, we got people still joining. Well, in the meantime, while we uh, wait on the people to join, um, okay, that's it. Uh, shout out to Martin Leakey. I see you in the chat room. Salutes to you. West Wing Bling. Salutes to you, West Wing Bling. Hey, Welcome hey, can you call. hear me? Loud and clear. You got the floor, man. Yeah. Appreciate you. Can y'all hear me? Yes, yeah, we can, can hear, hear you well. too. Mic check to everybody. We got I'm, all of y'all. Okay. Yeah. I'm literally right. just getting out of work. So the question I had, right? Not even question, but just a thought. You remember um, American Hello. Treasure with uh, Nicolas Cage? You remember that movie? Anybody remember it? I, I heard. I do. I heard, it sounds familiar. I know I've seen it before. Okay, perfect. So when he said that when you're woke, you go on this search, and if you're still searching, that means you're in the good spot and stuff. Well, um, that movie, the first one, right? Nicholas Cage goes into this, like, I don't know, ruins or something, and he breaks the wall, and he finds what he's looking for, right? He's like, oh, my God, this is this is what our ancestors are, right? But then there's another dude right next to him that says, this is it. We on the Zoom. <laughs> but if you want to learn more, then uh, keep going, right? Now, the reason I brought it up is because if you keep searching, right, and and you, you, you think you found something, but you, you keep searching for more and more, uh, is that like, can that turn into something bad? Like when you, you start like fixation over it and... And like you're like, yeah, but there's more out there. There's more than more, and that's the reason why I brought up the national and I mean national treasure treasure movie because he found everything he was looking for in that one one part, right? But then it was almost like the director or whoever was higher up was like, no, we need more trilogies of this. We need we need a part two and three. So let's let's extend it and just add on more stuff because these people that like this type of um, entertainment are going to still follow it because of what you said. So is it like they can be using that for bad and good? Just, just keep on searching, even if you think you found it and stuff? All right. You know? That's a good one. That's a good one, West Wing. And I'll, I'm going to answer you. it like this. I'm, I'm going to answer up. it like this. There does come a point in everybody's life and multiple times when so much learning actually becomes an impediment to knowing. This is when you need to do a personal pattern break. This is when you need to step back do something else for a while, enjoy the construct, and then when your soul begins tugging on you in a certain direction, you're going to be able to feel it. You're going to be hypersensitive to it because you're not doing spiritual activity. So when it does start singing to you again, you're going to, you're going to be awake and you're going to go into a whole other plateau of learning. I'm going to tell you now, I've done this multiple times. Learning is like a pyramid. You, you always think you're done and then you find a whole other level. Hmm. So yes, remember, 
Too much learning can be an impediment to knowing. And when that comes down and you start getting bogged down, that's when you do your pattern break. That's when you just break away from it all, go do your own thing, become a prodigal son for a little while, do whatever you do, all kinds of other activities, man. Get out of book, get out of videos. And then when you come back, you're going to find out that your spirit has basically eliminated all, all the bad data, incorporated all the good data. So when you come into contact with more spiritual information, historical, chronological, philosophical, spiritual, no, you have a better apparatus by which to determine fact from fiction. This is a process, man. You're never going to be done. This is something you're going to do all your life. But the pattern break is what's necessary. Yo, I learned that late in life. That is Thank some you. very good wisdom and advice right there. Yeah, because, you don't understand. You, you, you yeah, got me cheesing yeah. right now. Hell yeah. That's Thank a you. very Thank good. You. Because I, when I got into this thing, I used to say, you can't get enough knowledge. You, just, I'm learning. I'm just going to keep, you know, you, you got to go hard. Yo, it's some days I just want to make beats and I don't want to look at nothing. I want to do something that take my, and when I come back to my research, I'm refreshed. I'm ready to go. I ain't burnt. Yo, you even need a break from the knowledge. As crazy as that sound. That's some real stuff, though. Real talk, man. That is real. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I got a question. Yeah. Oh, go, oh, go ahead, Sanchez. No, I'm, I'm saying I'm and Rob. Welcome oh. back, man. Y'all got it. Well, yeah, first, first come. Oh first yeah, I got serve. a question for share. for Jason. I, I I got a couple questions, but I'm just gonna ask one. I'm gonna let everyone else go. Um, I mean, do you think um with them spraying chemicals in the sky and um weather modification that they may be trying to stop the phoenix or hinder the phoenix jason um for me to for me to agree that that could be a possible agenda then i would ha also have to agree that that all these things that these globalists have been putting out is also true such as uh it's really hard to wrap around. First of all, I'm going to say no. I don't believe. I don't. I don't believe they can affect human phenomenon. The world is too big of a place for our technology to affect. I don't believe in the. I don't believe in the greenhouse emissions, the carbon emissions. Listen, carbon is what runs our entire existence. I don't. This all the cars in the world are their exhaust is actually helping the flora. It's helping the trees and the plants, and all. that's what they breathe. So I, I'm not a. I'm just not. I'm not on. I'm not on board with. I don't know what they're doing with the spraying and the chemicals. I, I don't even like talking about it. I don't even talk about it on my channel because it's not something that I have firsthand information on. It's like it's like it's like it's just like the moon to me. It says I've never been up there, so I'm never going to affirmatively tell my 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 listeners that we humans have ever been on the moon. So uh, I don't know what they're spraying. I do know that. That Don and I have sat in the backyard, looked up at the sky, and when we're not far from International Airport here, Bush Intercontinental, and there are jets that put off these contrails. And then we've seen some large, huge jets that don't put a single contrail out. We've we've talked about it. So I, I don't know what's going on. This is not my area of expertise, but it's a uh, we we are we're we are we are small and have a very small impact. Uh, let me give you an example. You know that the media has pushed out the fact that they want electric cars because all the cars in the world are, are polluting the environment. This is the claim, but you never hear about the fact that all the vessels in the ocean that are pushing all of this hundreds of millions of cargo to all these ports at any given time, there's over 12,000 of these vessels out there emitting all this. It's way more than all the cars in the world combined. I've seen the research. It's very compelling. So they never mentioned this because it would stop all infrastructure if they were to stop it. Yeah. You know, so the argument is. Well, I agree. Well, yeah, I, I I agree. So so you saying um you don't believe that um there's weather modification programs like heart and none of that. So I didn't, no, I didn't say that. No, you said spraying the sky. So yeah, yeah, I did. You, no, I ain't trying to twist it. My bad. Yeah. Now, when it, when it comes to spraying the sky, I don't know if that's the the agenda. If you want to get a population sick, or if you want to get a population inoculated with something that can be that can go into the body by inhalation, then that's the way to do it through these aerosols. I don't know what they're doing. I'm not going to say uh, yay or nay, 
but yes, harp harp technology is real. Weather modification is real. Uh, there's no doubt. I have no I have no doubt in my mind that the U.S. military has a special branch that can use that can use natural phenomena and agitate it and exacerbate it like thunderstorms and turn them into something terrible uh tropical storms turn them into category fives uh just a simple lightning storm turn it into all-out plasma fallout yeah i believe i believe it's very we're very capable of doing that right now hey jason i got a question um i agree <laughs> with you can, can you hear me jason i can hear you okay yeah I, this is my first time ever even seeing you or knowing about you, but I trust you. If you come on Sanchez platform, I trust that your information is valid because uh, I trust him. Uh, but quick question. First well, first of all, I agree with you when you say too much learning can can hurt you just because you, you got to give yourself time to absorb what you learn. You got to learn, 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 and then absorb for a while. And, and, you know, and then you learn more. The question, and then I will say what the other brother was talking about when you were saying something about aerosols. I wanted to, the family to know, as long as the micron size of the aerosol is greater than three microns, it cannot get to the be deposited into your lungs. Uh, three microns, one to three is, is the best size because I'm a respiratory therapist. One to three microns is the best size for aerosol to be far penetrated and deposited into the lung. So if you can wear your mask, whatever you think you need to wear, that will change the micron size that cannot enter into your lungs. And then the last thing I will say, a question for you. Uh, do you think with that moon landing that you were talking about, you know, you're not has certain things that you can look at later on, like they, they lock it down for top secret for so many years and then finally they release it. Do you think there will ever be some type of release maybe 20, 30, 50 years from now proving that we never did go and it was just something that had to be top secret for whatever reason. Do you think it's something where they'll ever, they'll ever admit to, or they always lie? Cause I think with the technology growing so much, they can't lie for so much longer. If it is a lie, you know, how, how could you know, they continue? I agree, with you. I, I agree with you, but there's an element missing from, from uh, this cognitive leap that, that you're, you're missing. Um, in 2040, in the month of May, we have returning to our world something that is very well documented. This is what my channel is about, the Phoenix Phenomenon. This is all they're waiting for, 16.5 years. They're not going to have to deceive anybody anymore. It's total reset. They're not, they're not worried about that. They'll be in the underworld hiding when, when there's all kinds of fallout on one hemisphere of our world. Now, it doesn't matter. I'm a simulationist. I believe all this is simulated as an experiment, but it's simulated to copy a real reality that is somewhere else. Now, the reason I'm saying this is you, you, you're, you've basically, so you've basically brought up the position that, that after a period of time, like they've released a lot of classified documents to tell the truth about, they're going to, no, I don't believe they're ever going to tell the truth about the moon. They don't need to. The damage has already been done and it can't be undone. The true, the true reason they even pulled off the PSYOP to begin with is because NASA, NASA is like four billion dollars a year. It gets this budget. For what? They're not even sending anything up there. NASA is an intelligence agency. NASA funds a lot of black ops stuff. It's all, all over the world. I mean. Uh, I just, I just, I just saw some very compelling research. Very compelling research shocked me. I'm not surprised, but it shocked me how easy it was for somebody to find the whole entire Mars scenery, everything they sh NASA has showed about Mars. The dude found it on Google Earth in Iceland. Shocked me, man. Blows it up, shows it. Show, it show, they got the Mars rover still out there. They don't even give a damn. So. They got, they got NASA trucks and NASA vehicles out there. They got every, it's crazy. But all this, they don't even care about being caught no more. It's too late for all that. They don't give a damn. It's a, this is why in 2020, everything started falling apart. They didn't care. They don't care no more that everybody's pointing, finger pointing on all the evil senator stuff that's going on in Hollywood. They don't care anymore. They don't care about everybody now realizes there's no such thing as a Republican and Democrat and that both, and that all politicians are, are, are pieces of shit. They don't care. They don't care that exactly. systemically we are now seeing the total absolute collapse of all our cherished institutions. They don't care. They don't care at all because all they wanted to do was 
use these stimulus packages that they have drained from the American economy to fund their underground operations while they're getting ready. This is something they have done over and over and over and over. Not news to any anybody in the chat feed that's from the Archaics family. They already know. They've already seen all the evidence. This is the whole end game for them. They don't care about, about what we know anymore. This is why all these, this is why people, hell, YouTube doesn't even seem to be censoring anymore. People are all over YouTube talking about different stuff now. People with 500,000 subs are now openly talking about things you couldn't even whisper on YouTube two years ago. They don't care. They just don't care anymore. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that. I'm going to check your channel out. Uh, you know that Starlink, that, uh, uh, that Starlink satellites that they said was, I did see that. I wonder what you want, if you guys know what that really was, but I, I do have video of my eyes and my own what it was, but they said it was going to be a, a link to Starlink. It's like 40 or 50 straight lights that were going across my sky one night, and I videoed. I think I sent it to Sanchez, emailed it to him, but I just wanted to, do you have a, uh, an answer of what that is? Yes. I don't know. I have no idea. I've seen it with my own eyes, too. I've seen, I've seen it with Dawn in, in the skies of New Mexico. And I saw it Me over too. Willis, Texas, right over my property at about two o'clock in the afternoon. And I know I saw it for a fact because all over Facebook, they were they were showing pictures of it as well. That's the exact same time I saw it. I don't know. I know it's real easy to invent a scenario and call it Starlink and then have Elon Musk, who is a part of the elite, play ball and say, hey, man, we need you to claim that you developed this. Uh, sure. We got this. We got this thing flying around now, and uh, we need people to associate it with what you're doing, even though it might be something totally different. This is beyond my my expertise. I don't know. I'm just theorizing, but uh, I don't know what Starlink is, and I don't know how uh, an individual strand of luminaries that I saw would provide internet uh, all the time when you only see it once once every six months over a certain area, and then it's gone. So how is it working for the whole world if, if if it's if it's so if it's so local that it can be seen and then it vanishes while you're looking at it? So right. I don't know. I just don't know. Right. Don't know so about it. Starlink isn't these sh shooting stars is what we're seeing. Basically, what we're seeing is these streaks of light that come across the sky and they fade away before you can see them get all the way to the other side of the horizon line. When I was in White Sands, New Mexico. Man, when at nighttime, when I, I was in the Army National Guard, I was at White Sands Missiles Range. And at nighttime, we far away from like the cities in New Mexico and stuff. We training out in the in the in the in the desert and stuff. And I swear, away from the light pollution of the cities, the light, the, the sky looked like dust. It's so many stars in the sky, like you can't even make out constellations. And then you, it's so active, stuff just shooting everywhere. Phew, phew. And I realized why New Mexico is the UFO capital of America. Uh, it should be the shooting star capital, but they want to write this off as, you know, have an alien industry and all that. But, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting stuff. Um, the, the Starlink is something else, though. That's <laughs> something else. That's That's a new internet grid that they they want to make the new web above us instead of under us like and you know they want to have like these balloons and all over the earth making a big grid communicating with each other making a new internet like in a sky on that level but i'm not sure where they at with the research on that they was launching balloons up at one point to make this big grid of start the, the, the you know the satellites is the star they link them together, make a grid. But that's two different things. I don't fall back right there. Uh, good question and, too. And Jay, I have a question, Jason. I've uh, been following you for about a year, but before that, I came up with this idea. I was sitting there trying to come up with, you know, what if there's a? I know this is a this is a reach, but what if there's a positive angle to why the elites do what they do? And I'm just playing with the idea. And I came up with this idea that what if they were doing, especially the wars in Europe, uh, especially a lot of the the great depopulate depopulization wars that happened, like uh, the Napoleonic Wars. You know, we mentioned Napoleon earlier, but that was a great one because all these guys were all part of the same fraternity and they all took their people and went to war with each other and had them all kill each other. And I, this sort of thing has happened throughout history, especially in Europe, over and over and over. And I was just wondering, you know, 
when I try to come up with a positive angle for that, which I'm not saying that this is it, right? But when I try to come up with a positive angle for that, what I come up with is what if they were trying to depopulate or stent uh, some sort of development just for the sake of uh, prolonging some sort of disaster that happens once it hits a certain point of development? And I wanted to run that past you. Uh, I know that sounds really sci-fi, but this all sounds very sci-fi. But um, what oh, let do you me think address about- that. Address that before before you discount you discount what what you just asserted as an idea on my channel in the past, I have entertained that, but I've only entertained it as an aside, just mentioning it, just mentioning that. And I, I got a lot of blowback, even from my own community. I got a lot of blowback because they didn't really understand how deep the thinking was. When I, I made a statement when I was doing a video with Joel perceiver about the elite, we have a very popular video called, uh, uh, I, from, uh, from, uh, uh, high tech to toll tech who really are the elite and in that video i kind of postulate there may be something we're not seeing and that this governor that that actually causes the phoenix phenomenon because the phoenix phenomenon is is a phenomenon of magnitude it changes its magnitude of destruction and effect how it affects our world every, every 138 years so i'm going to tell you this rather than answer your question you seem like a pretty good communicator, and I've seen you in my chat quite a bit, especially with Shiva Shampoo. I will lay this challenge to you. You come up with five reasons why this could be a benefactor protocol, even though it sounds nefarious from the perspective of those of us suffering through these wars. I will bring you on my channel. We'll have an open discussion about it and see what comes up, comes of it. That'd be great. I read a lot of Nietzsche, and he would back this idea up a lot. That's kind of where I got the concept. You, like he talks well, about a war by the uh, the the hires declared on the mediocre. Okay, and, what uh, you're describing what you're describing is a queen's gambit. All right? right, right. In chess, in chess, it's a queen's gambit. You make a huge sacrifice in order to stay in the game. In order, hey, so, yep. so yes, hey, I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board with the discussion. Uh, I I don't like to really speculate on things that I haven't really prepared for because this is rather deep and. Yeah. My research all goes in one direction, and I'm willing to go in another direction because it doesn't affect chronological issues. It, it, it affects interpretation. So, so if you come up with five five things and email them to me, I'll bring you on my channel, and we'll openly talk about it. You got it. Thanks, man. Hey, that, 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 that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good deal. Let me, let me say this, and we'll pass it to AM1. I like what Sarcastic brought up. I'm going to be brief. Um, I've spoke on this uh, several times that – when we say everything happened for a reason, even the people in power oppressing us, it, it's a reason for it. So I look at this place like a simulation, and, and they say life is a dream, but it's a nightmare. If the ancestors wanted to break souls out of this simulation, it's like me infiltrating your dream and being the boogeyman. Because you think the dream is real, I got to now scare you out of the dream. This is just a theory that I come up with. I say the people in power may be the ancestors that invented the simulation, causing all of this chaos so that we can be uncomfortable. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. If it wasn't for these, uh, it's some little background noise going on, so I muted everybody. But if it wasn't for these people in power, I probably wouldn't even be at this point of my mental paradigm now because it's it was them that made me look for the knowledge. Like it was looking at how evil like the people that the rich are, the people, the elite, as we call them, the people in power that sent me that let me know something was wrong with the world. Because I used to say if I had that much power, I would help people. I would do this. So I that let me know some ain't right about the world and I think they playing a role in this thing like everybody playing roles and it's their job to be the boogeyman to make you because if they make us comfortable here will our souls will be trapped in a fake simulation versus the base reality so I do think that's a way to look at it but it's just a theory and I'm gonna pass the mic to AM1 thank you for letting me uh, respond uh, you know interject on that I'm gonna fall back you yeah, know, that's a great point, Sanchez. It's like uh, there has to be some kind of level of, I don't know, duality that's some kind of impetus for some kind of 
elevation, some kind of progress, evolution of consciousness, so to speak, while we're in here. So that's an interesting point. I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I want to lay a question down. You guys can hear me okay, right? Yeah. I want to lay a yeah. question. Shout out to Jason Sanchez, obviously, uh, the whole chat. Much appreciation. Uh, last time Jason was in here, he said, if I can make a list of questions and uh, hit him up with that, that he'll, he'll, we could potentially do like a discussion on that. I had this question specifically uh, on that list. But based on the discussion you guys were having earlier, I think I want to drop this question now. So here's what it is. You guys were talking about the importance of and uniqueness of Giza, the pyramids there versus pyramid structures, megalithic structures all around the world, which is extremely interesting. But I'm curious to know Jason's perspective on this. And let me set this up a little bit more. There is the discussion of obviously the North Pole, Mount Meru, these kind of discussions. Obviously, uh, can you guys mute? Can you guys mute? Can you guys mute? Gotcha. All right. So the North Pole, Mount Meru, uh, magnetic north, right? So obviously there's something there. Objectively, we can see there's something going on there. But obviously there's some super interesting um, encodings in the Giza Plateau Great Pyramid, right? So we, we see these two things. Jason has talked about with either a, a coming shift or a past shift. I think you said a coming shift. There's a movement of, I, I guess would be called a pole shift, but some kind of like crustal move, displacement where there'll be a 30 degree shift. Jason, correct me on that if I'm getting that wrong, but a 30 de degree shift. And I think it's counterclockwise to where essentially everything outside of that circle with the pyramids being in the center would shift counterclockwise at 30 degrees. So from the perspective of the far east, that would shift north. From the perspective of the west, that would shift south. So everything would shift by 30 degrees. Jason, am I getting that right? Oh, oh Yo, you, you uh, got to unmute your mic, Jason. I had new people joining with background noise, so I muted them, everybody. There we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're absolutely right. Uh, you described it perfectly. Okay, so I just want to make sure I was setting that up properly. So considering that shift, a pole shift, if that's kind of like the center of mass and that's where the sort of spin would be or the fulcrum point of the spin, what do you think is the relevance of the current placement of the North Pole relative to Polaris, relative to some type of sky clock simulation above us and it's circling above us? Because obviously we're not on a spinning ball flying through space where there weren't some kind of simulation or what. Clearly that's not the case. The physics just totally shit on that. But I'd love to know your thoughts on the idea of why is Polaris seemingly above the North Pole? The magnetism points toward the North Pole. Clearly there's some importance there, right? Versus what is the significance and importance of uh, the Great Pyramids in Giza? And why would that be the next shift point, the fulcrum point, the center point, the axis point of the next shift? If that makes sense, let me know. But I, I think you know where I'm going with that. Well, there's a lot to unpack in all that. But so, but first, I, I'm going to, I'm going to straighten you out about San Diego, man. You didn't show up. You didn't show up, man. I said, <laughs> oh, I had, oh, go ahead. Go we, ahead. Dawn and, Dawn and I had already told security at the door. Big Cole and Big John were at the door waiting on you, man. They already had you seating. All that shit was arranged. But we thought you were coming with a cameraman. Yeah, I am a cameraman. I was going to go, but uh, the way I set it up, I hadn't heard back. And then another gig popped up. And I didn't want to keep bugging you guys because I know how event production works. So, yeah. man, yeah, I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah, well, it was all right. I, we, had, we, had a, we had a blast. There's a lot of people showed up. But uh, in uh, answer to your que question, first of all, when it comes to pole shift, I don't buy into the uniformitarian perspective about the about the crustal. It's called lithospheric displacement. It is when the it's when the crust slips over the mantle. Now, I don't buy into that. I believe all pole shift is manufactured in the stellosphere, meaning there's no difference from the perspective of humans on the surface if it's the whole sky shifting. If the whole dome of the sky shifts, it's the exact same effect. 100%. So the, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you now, I, I heard brother Sanchez say it. And I know it's the, I know a lot of, a lot of occult material talks about these. I don't know anything about a pyramid or a mountain at the North Pole. I don't know anything about it. To me, we're living in a toroid field. We we're living in a simulated construct that is shaped like a toroid field, which to yeah. me means that there isn't a, a mountain at the North and there isn't a pyramid at the North, but it's actually a hole. 
It's the inner earth theory. Yeah, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me. Let me cook with you on that. It's both. Remember I showed you the pyramid with the hole in it? Like, think of a volcano. It's a pyramid with a hole in it at the top. That That's what's going on. But I can show you the Taurus field so, because no, I'm, I, with, I'm with you, Jason. I'm with you let, on let that. Let me add more to that for both of you guys because this is super interesting. But go ahead, Sanchez. Here is the pyramid. This was going on. If you split this in half in the middle and just put a line for the equator, that's the dielectric inertia plane. This one don't have the dielectric inertia plane, but this is cut right in the middle. But the thing is, when we get to the North Pole, uh, you see how the bottom here makes this, this pyramid and how the energy will be coming in and out of this pyramid. If the energy will be coming from the top down, like I showed with the hourglass, when you drop the sand and it makes this pyramid, this is what... Uh, a lot of people say, including Mercator said, we see. And if you see how these magnetic ley lines are feeding out at the base of the pyramid, those expand to create the magnetic ley lines that most of these monuments sitting upon, such as the Great Pyramid, Giza, Kukulkan. All of those are on, like, think of the North Pole as a tree. And then all the roots coming from the tree are the magnetic ley lines right here. And this mountain, think of like a tree trunk, and then all these, the roots coming, expanding from the tree trunk. And let's just say that the biggest roots, right, are those powerful ley lines that we got a lot of the world monuments on and ancient structures on and stuff. So that's interesting, too. But, yeah, that, Jason's right, though. It, it's, it, at the center of a Taurus field is a black hole, but it's it's. That's what's at the t uh, p cap in the pyramid off that eye at the pyramid. That's the hole opening. Okay. If I could add a little bit more to that, because Sanchez, I'm glad you brought that up, right? The whole Taurus field element or that you expanded on that. The Taurus field element. Obviously, there's some kind of field, right? Because at least objectively, we can see there's a magnetic field that all points north. So, again, I'm just curious, even Jason, if you could speculate about the idea of what happens if there's a even a shift in like – uh holographic stellosphere where seemingly the central point which i think we we can all agree of polaris the north pole appears to be in alignment with this taurus field at the north pole as it currently sits if that were to shift over to let's say the great pyramid and if seemingly the land i guess or from our perspective everything shifts 30 degrees I, does I that see mean going. you see where i'm going with this does that mean that theoretically if there is a hole there or a pyramid there i've heard it described both ways wouldn't that shift more to where Canada is theoretically, right? Or am I thinking of that the wrong way? If literally, if there is some kind of mass shift, continental shift, shift of oh, land. I, I think, okay, so in, in your mind, in your mind, the toroid field will slip with, with the continent. It's exactly. Gonna... I was curious, I, just your thought on that. I've been speculating on that, and I had that as a question, you. but you guys kind of went into it. Okay, well, the... uh. In ancient times, the Great Pyramid wasn't called pyramid. That's a Greek word. It was there. It, it was a Greek word of very late antiquity. It was originally called a pillar. In old text, it was like Irem of the pillars. And this was the two Great Pyramids. Uh, Irem was supposed to be the, the architect. This is before Irem. Irem lived before the flood. He was like a grandson of Cain. But this uh this um this pillar concept is is the same thing you're talking about because a pillar in the ancient world is no different than a tree. All you've done, all they've done, is taken the limbs off. This is what pillars were in ancient times. So the divine, the divine tree in the pyramid were were also interchangeable symbols. And I show in my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, that the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of, and the tree of life are are metaphors for the two great pyramids, and that Eden has never been lost, and that the Sphinx is the watcher called the cherub that was at the edge of the garden to prevent mankind from going back into into paradise. What's laid out in Giza is the story of the Garden of Eden and the beginning of mankind after a reset, all laid out in stone. But the all the story also tells of a thirty degree shift in the stellosphere. The, this pillar used to be zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude in the ancient world, but we don't find that anymore. Something has happened. The Great Pyramid is now thirty degrees north latitude. That's not where it started. That's not where it started at all. But uh, yeah. Um, I just don't know. I, I, I just don't know about the North Pole. I don't know anything about it because we don't have any. 
we we don't have any books about anybody who's gone there. And yeah, we do. We do. We do. We got plenty of, and we got a lot of uh, explorers' diaries and journals, such as Captain Cook. Um, you know, the things we don't have a lot of information about are the things that are truly occult or what we call hidden. That's why it intrigued me about the North Pole. I'm going to show you all something about Freemasonry. Here go the two pillars. In Freemasonry, what are those two pillars? The sun and the moon above a flat earth. This is what Freemasons teach, that the... Uh, the, the earth is flat and closed in the dome. And in the middle of it, that G is the top of the pyramid. I told y'all about where the light is bursting out, where souls are entering and exiting. That's like a spiritual cosmic boulevard, according to a lot of the ancestors, of, um, how the consciousness gets inside of the body. But when we talk about the pole shift, right, um, the compasses would let us know if there's a pole shift or if the magnetism at the North Pole is shifting anywhere else, then the compasses won't point to zero degrees anymore. Or let's say the pole shifted to Giza. Then all the compasses will point to Giza now. So that's a way we have a mechanical tool where we can kind of uh, uh, see what's going on magnetic-wise on magnetic wise on the Earth. Now, what, what I think a real pole shift is, is our earth, our hollow sphere right here. This is a Taurus field, what, what, what the Masons teach we're in and all that right here, right? Our, our hollow sphere, it splits sometime. And here is a cell splitting. So if you check out what happens when a cell split, let me, let me show you this. Moses showed us this when he broke apart the sea right our world is really a, a work in progress it's not fully like when we said that there's a pole shift happening guess what the pole shift is happening as i speak right now that there are two worlds intertwined with each other right now heaven and hell and two different energies on this earth that are fighting this war that they call armageddon and that that is what's going to eventually separate this entire thing. This 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 image right here, what we see all around the world of our universe of a magnetism and all that is literally a cell splitting. A cell in a process of splitting. So when they talk about this God called a reaper, this was the God of the North Pole, the reaper. And that word means ripper. It's ripping apart reality right here in the center. This is what's going on. A cell is being split. So if you even look at these Nazca lines and look at the crop circles all over the world, this is showing us a field of magnetic energies. They worship a, a deity in Jamaica called a Nazi the spider. Check this out. Here go the Nazca lines. Here go a Nazi the spider right here. This is the Dogon Kananga as well that's showing us the center of magnetism being deified as a deity in this this little hourglass shape in the middle here they turned that into this right here so it's showing how it's all holding up the universe is being held up by the secrets of magnetism uh i i did a lecture the other day about a silver certificate in the in the 1900s where they were teaching that electromagnetism was the highest force in the universe that was just in the 1900s in the 1900s on the civil certificate but uh yeah I, uh this thing about rupus is the word reaper or, or, or you know ripper you what you need to know about the north pole is this get a compass and ask yourself why all compasses is responding to this North Pole area? What is it there? The highest concentration of electromagnetic energy is where all compasses point at. That just so happened to be the center of the Earth and the point where the time is being created, where the sun and moon are going around that pole. And here is the sun and moon's path over a flat earth and how you get the seasons and all that. But what is this, though? What, what is this? It's, as it's a fractal code. It is a Christmas tree with the star at the top or uncapped pyramid. You know how we got the pyramid, the step pyramid with the all-saying eye? That's literally the sun path 
over the flat earth. Why? Because our sun and moon are literally falling around a huge pyramid at the North Pole. And that's why they get slimmer as they go up. They're tracing the outline of this magnetic pyramid that the ancestors call Mount Maru. Even the sun and moon is showing us uh, that this is basically how you get this big Christmas tree thing because this makes this how we wrap the lights around the tree, the DNA strand, stairway to heaven, and at the top you would have Polaris right there where the sun, it, it once it get to that point, it turns around and start to descend and get back wider. But this is a lot to unpack. Um, basically, this is what this subtle energy device is. I'm going I'm to end right here. And you guys can do further research from there. I just wanted to add on to what AM1 asked, but I don't want to halt the mic too long. So we'll move, we'll keep it moving from there. Hey, hey, I appreciate that. And sorry, uh, so sort of sidetrack the whole Q&A with that, but I just wanted to ask that question. I thought it was relevant because you guys kind of discussed that oh, earlier. Yeah. Uh, I got to drop off because I got to get some work done. But again, uh, as always, shout out uh, bro Sanchez and Jason. Jason, I'm still compiling the list of questions. I hope you, I can uh, take you up on that offer. To kind of do a, a Q and A with you when I get that all set up, I'll drop you. Yeah, email. man, it's all good. All right, thanks a lot, y'all. Peace. Peace. Out, y one hey, and Jason, I have a question, man. I have a question. So, I have a um, question too. do you think that the 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 cap of the pyramid? Do you think that that could have held some type of like um like some kind of frequency with our brains, and it was decapped on purpose, maybe to uh. Kind of like how you uh, destroy um, a cell phone tower. Do you think that it was uh, decapped because uh, of the frequency? Like how Sanchez was saying before, how um, the pyramid could have been used like some kind of battery where as uh, soon as you go into it, your soul could be sent somewhere or you you you, you could be uh, transported, you know, through frequencies and through vibrations. You know, maybe the pyramid was decapped on purpose by some you know the other civilizations before us uh i don't know but there is i mean there's proof that some type of force was initiated inside the king's chamber and I, I, don't get triggered by kings and queens chambers this is just the architectural designations we know that that chamber was never built for a pharaoh or a king or anything. This is just what the the Egyptologists have named those chambers, so we can so we can describe what's going on, what what parts of the architecture we're referring to. But that king's chamber has been blown out an inch in all directions. And considering the fact that the stones on the ceiling are seventy tons, that's an amazing amount of pressure because there's still 60 more courses of stone above that. That immense amount of weight and pressure for something in the king's chamber to explode it and blown all the walls out, ceiling and floor, uh, one inch. It's amazing. This was known This was known in 1901 and 1902 by, by uh, Sir Flinders Petrie, who measured everything in the pyramid to the thousandths of an inch. His measurements are the only ones accepted by Egyptologists today. And they're precise. They're, they're awesome. But even even Christopher Jones, engineer in in uh, 1990s, when he researched the site, he said he, he, can't, he can't figure out what it was. To me, I believe they were pulling water up through that well. I believe water was going through that well, and I have shown on my channel all the engineering marks that are in the Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery has a niche system where a cog would have went up in high and in a high in a high pressure environment. Some type of mechanism use that crack. That is a definitive crack in the uh, uh, grand gallery. Anybody can see it in the architectural diagrams. It's you, you can't miss it. It's a tra same type of tracks we use today. Something was in a high pressure environment was going up and down that chamber. Maybe it was building pressure. I don't know, but it blew out that king's chamber, and it, it's visible. It's it's visibly noticeable how smooth the walls are from whatever explosion happened inside the Great Pyramid. But uh, I can't imagine. Well, maybe maybe it was free energy. I don't know what it was. I can't speculate. But the fact that it was high pressure explosion uh, is, is a subject matter to several books. Hey, and good question but, to whoever that was about the missing capstone. The concept of the missing capstone, right, to all of these pyramids is it goes back to the whole concept that you don't want to cap a volcano. Because you want the, like, you don't want, if you got a, a pus, pus 
sore on you, a, 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 a raise on the skin. You don't want to stop the pus from coming out. You don't cap. You want it uncapped. The concept that air, this pyramid is uncapped is part of its design. The fact that the highest point in our universe is the most central point. That is the point where the hollow spear, this whole holographic simulation is being projected from. So just like this uh, movie being projected on the wall, our reality is a holographic projection of light, just like the triangle, that's the canopy, right there, un un expanding like the Quran say. Here is our universe with the firmament dome. This square represents the ground we walk on. It's a projected reality. When you look at pictures of the Big Bang, they're showing you that. So and, and where where is the big the light of the Big Bang being projected from? How do you create physical reality out of light through holography, hollow spear? So our world is a projection. Plato's cave is talking about this concept too. Now this pyramid of light that we're looking at, right, um, is not capped because it leads into the source that's projecting it. Uh, it leads right. So it is when you see the, uh, the all saying eye at the top of the pyramid on the other side of this camera is an eye. So basically our whole reality is like projection. When you see Jay-Z throwing up the dynasty sign, they, they showing you one eye because when you take a picture with a camera photosynthesis, you take it's a selfie It's like one eye. So. The, the word camera is got the word maru in it, the word mirror in it. What's going on at the North Pole is your base self at the base reality is basically taking a selfie called an avatar, the body, and it's projecting itself via the central nervous system into the simulation. But your body ain't the real you. When the body lay back down, the real you will wake up at the base reality like Neo. So this image of the camera represents the pod. That's you sleep at the base reality. And in your sleep, you're dreaming. You're projecting yourself into a simulation. Um, within like we do in a dream and that's in that simulation you're recreating yourself in an avatar this is the whole concept of uh photosynthesis um 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 you know with photos being developed they need the water the red light the blue light that's magnetism red shift blue shift waters of ethereal waters so this whole concept of uh the, the pyramid not having a capstone but an all-seeing eye is because when you snap a picture, the camera make a pyramid of light. That's the Big Bang. That's what copied you. And then, But the eye on the other side of the camera, one, that person got one eye closed, one eye open, and that's the one eye at the top of the pyramid. Think of photography. But, yeah, we can, go to, we can, right. we can keep it but, uh, moving, though. <clears throat> But what I was meaning with the question was, you don't think that that capstone, like how you were saying with the camera, what if uh, opposite? What if if the capstone is put back, we see what was once not being able to be seen? You know, well, it like if you was to take a lens off the camera, it'll still work, but it won't work right till you put that lens back on. What if with the cap being put back on, we could see what wasn't being seen in the simulation? You know, the cat was removed, maybe yeah, making that, it that's, easier that's to what manipulate. That, that's what I was telling you. The cap was never removed. It just came without a cap. Uh, it just okay. come that way okay. with, no, with no cap. When we say in the hood today, no cap, that means we telling the truth. That means I'm not lying to you. No cap, right? So the concept of no cap, the truth is revealed at the base reality. Capitalism is about cap hiding things over a veil or capping it. We can get it. That's a whole nother thing. I want to keep the mic moving for the uh, panel, but yeah, go ahead. Hey, yo, I got, I got a small theory for that though. The, uh, the crystals that are on the, on the queen's um, uh, crown. I, I, I always had like a theory that those crystals were the tippity top, like, like, like the point of the pyramid you know, adjacent to the rest of, of the capstone being made out of quote unquote organite. And like, it, and the, there was like a projection of light, like he was saying, like a lens 
that was projected out into the uh, simulation where we could see different phases of light, uh, you know, more than just the seven phases of light that we naturally see. I'm, and, uh, I'm not. I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that was a question, but I want to know if there's no, anybody I, that got I, a I, question. I, I got a. I actually got a question for Jason about uh, about the canopy. Um, uh, yo, uh, Jason, like uh, when you talk about the canopy, and then I hear you and uh, Brother Sanchez speak on um, uh, the flat Earth theory. So I, I believe both of y'all spoke on this this topic right here. That um, that basically. What if we are still in the uh, what is it called the, uh, the what if we are still in the flood, right? And so, like, if we're still in the flood, all the places in the ocean and all the different you know lakes and different uh, uh, you know you know dinges into the ground, those what, what if those were like different canopies? Like, what if there wasn't just one canopy? but many canopies on different areas of the earth where there are different altitudes and those different altitudes created different canopy uh, um, scenarios, whether it be dense, you're, you're, you're uh, dense correct. air, light air, you know, dense water, light water and, and things of that nature, but just different ones all around the world, not just one dense one all around the world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He kind of, that's a real. That's a whole lot. I don't know if Jason. If, you were muted, Jason. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, salutes to you, Salas. Saw you on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on board. I'm on board with the fact that we've lived through different biospheres. We lived through desert worlds, ice worlds. We've lived. We've lived through post cataclysm reset worlds. Oh, uh, we've definitely lived lived in in two or more vapor canopy worlds. We're living in a temperate world right now, which has a wide variety of local local biospheres like you're describing i mean that's the world what you're asking me is a perfect description of the world we live in now you you can get in a plane you can go to somewhere somewhere very very cold and see nothing but snow and ice or you can get in that same plane and within a day or two be in somewhere that's hotter than hellfire and and not and no moisture uh totally different humidity so this temperate reality we're, in, we're living in now has a lot of diversity i don't believe that diversity existed in prior in prior sims in prior sims there were whole there were times when the entire world was was a certain way and uh with the collapse of the vapor canopy i believe that's a perfect a perfect explanation for for where all the water all the fresh water came to build the two mile high ice caps and snow caps that we have that uh so i'm uh i don't know I, I, that's the best way I can answer your answer your question. I believe that through through the human experience, we've lived through multiple sims, and we live. I mean, you have to you have to imagine being on a Star Trek holo deck, and you and I are hunting rabbits, and we're running through the damn forest, and we're looking for these rabbits, and and no matter how far we run, it's multiple different terrains, but in the end. It's a flat program. We just don't know it's flat because the, the programming has us going up and down all these different terrains in our mind. It's all virtual reality. And yet, when we look up up at the sky, it's all curvature. And it's this beautiful starry dome going by. And finally, one of us gets that rabbit. And when we turn off the simulator and we're standing in a white room, we were just in a world that was flat, but then again, it was curved. And the sky, the sky was all completely simulated and holographic, but to us, optically, it was completely uh, like a dome, a painted dome, a stellosphere. So it's it's all a matter of perspective. This is why I'm a simulationist. I don't believe we live on a globe, and nor do I believe the world is flat in an endless realm that just goes on and on and on. I believe that it, I believe it's the reality has the properties of a toroid field, and that we're on the inside of that, and all phenomena is is, is what we're seeing around us, and it's how we interpret our world. I believe by virtue of the central nervous system, we are jacked into a reality that we perceive as real when it is not. It's not at all. You, you know, in the middle of a torus field, that's something called a dielectric inertial plane that splits the torus. Let me let me show that real quick. The flat earth ain't really a belief. It's, it's, it's just a fact based upon us being in a Taurus field. And when you, it's a paradox that the earth is flat and round. The fact that it's two parts of it. The outside of it is round, but the part we walk on is flat. And I use a level in my house every day. I know that as a man with a level that is sea level and is flat. 
when we say the earth is a is a Taurus field, yes, and 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 the mountain at the middle of the earth is where the magnetism is building up. Can we see that we're walking on a dielectric inertial plane or a grounding point? That's why we call it the ground. But when you get to the middle of our earth, that's the seed that is spanned the entire Taurus field. That's what when, when we call it a hollow spear, watch this, right? Let me just show this. When they say that we live in a expanding universe, it's just like this. The base reality is exactly what the hollow reality is. It's just an expanded version. This is called a expanding spiritoy, but this actually shows like the, what the uni how the universe is expanded from a small, compressed, dense form into a just a hollow, hollow, big, inflated, you know, uh, hollow thing. So that's what exactly what's happening around a magnet, that the dense magnet has this huge hollow energy field around it, but that energy field is just as physical as the magnet, which is why trying to put two magnets together, it's a force there. We can scale that up. Magnets the size of a house, magnets the size of a subwoofer speaker, you wouldn't even be able to push them together. They'll smush you in between them like a sheet of paper. Magnetism is the uh, dominant force in the universe. Everything is revolving around the center of magnetism, and that's why our compass is working, because we live inside of a Taurus field. Shooting an azimuth is literally based upon these magnetic ley lines that are all pointing toward zero degrees. From zero degrees in the middle of this universe, grit point coordinates are born around zero. And now locations, time is formed, time and space. Now I can meet you at anywhere on a grid at different coordinate points with a compass. But if we both meet at zero degrees, we ain't on the grid. We, it's a hole in the middle of the grid and that's where this whole, they show this experiment where they take a sheet of paper to, to symbolize time and they poke a pencil through it to symbolize a wormhole through time. And that's what's happening at the North Pole. But the pyramid that Mercator is talking about is magnetic. We can see it here. See, when we go on to the North Pole, we're literally walking the uh, sky is actually rising up higher and higher as we go there. So the pressure start to increase, just like in the ocean where uh, the deeper you go, the water will crush you because there's so many layers of water stacked on you. Well, if you look at where we exist outside of Eden in the middle of the earth, the sky gets lower. So we're not walking up under that many layers of atmosphere in these outer realms. But as we travel toward the center, the sky is like more, more layers stacked upon you all the way to the middle. We, can't ha we don't have technology that can literally penetrate s these areas. And the ancestors spoke about actually taking a spiritual journey to these places. Now, they said when you try to go physically, it can be detrimental because ships get sucked in this vortex and all that. Eric Dubay got a good video on that one, too. But um, this, this right here is what the hollow spear is. And I'm just sh sharing with everybody that, you know, it ain't flat because I want it to be or because I got some fetish with... Flat Earth is because I studied magnetism and I realized that when you it's a battery where negative meet positive like a Duracell battery, you get this line and the energy right there. It it creates this pocket, this small, thin pocket of of of, of just uh, space. And that's where we reside at and the ground below with the sky above. And these represent two polarizing forces because at, at, at the surface of the ground, if you put a seed in, the, seed in the ground, the tree is growing up and down just like us. From the surface of the ground below, the seed is, is growing its roots downward. And from the surface of the uh, up, it's growing up. So it's being stressed at the waistline just like us. At the waistline, our legs are actually growing toward the ground. And then our waist up, we're, we're growing up. The torso is growing up. Things is being stretched toward the center, and that's what's happening in the middle of a Taurus field. The energy is being stretched right here 
as you can see in between these two cones. But uh, that's what happens in an expanding spear. You stretch it at both of the ends to expand it, and that's literally creation unfolding, the Big Bang, an expanding spear, magnetic energy. But, so, but this is why that you have this plane at the middle because that's just what the, the magnet, that's how magnetism forms itself with that pyramid in the middle with a beam shooting up. So if you look at this little diagram here, this is the Hebrew cosmos as, as well as many others. Uh, we're walking on this little small pocket in between the sky and ground in the middle of this Taurus field. And uh, when we get to the middle, there's a pyramid right here with the energy flowing in and out of our reality and, to, uh, and around the whole hollow sphere. I'm not going to go too deep into this. I think I actually made the point, but... Yeah, that's just for everybody, man. We sharing information. I'm going to pass the mic around. Salutes to everybody. I, yeah, I just want to say gotta... you, you were not sharing that on this end, on our end here on the panel. Can everybody on the panel see my screen share? You should be able to see. There we are. Now we can. Now we good. I, I, got, a, I got another question. I'm going to get out of here uh, for Jason. And I'm going to get up out of here. Um, yeah, my question is, um, um, as it pertains to the Phoenix, uh, like in Revelation, when it says that the uh, uh, the beast and the prophet was thrown into the lake of fire and the remnant was slain with the sword, is that could that be connected to the Phoenix? Because a fire raining down from heaven, or is that more metaphoric and more spiritual? Because I think even that ties to the Phoenix. Yeah, I wouldn't know. It's that that passage you're referring to is way after the uh, sixth seal. Uh, to me, the okay. sixth seal, the sixth seal of the apocalypse, is a perfect description of the Phoenix phenomenon as it's appeared multiple times in human history on the 138 year timeline. The sixth seal is a perfect description. The sun turns black as sackcloth of hair. The uh, the moon turns red as blood. Rocks fall from the sky. There is an earthquake felt by the entire world. People hide in the dens and in, in the caves of the uh, caves and, and under the rocks and then the entire sky rolls like a scroll a perfect it is a perfect description of a pole shift so i'm a that's that's the i sixth agree seal. Yep. that's the sixth seal anything after that is going to be some other type it could be nemesis x it could be dark satellite it would probably be be attached to a, a totally different phenomenon and, and again with that whole pole shift our universe is expanding and it reach a point just like a sail, which is where the Taurus field is. Once it is spanned to its climactic point, it splits into two. So it's the concept where it don't die, it multiplies. And when it splits, we get a Mandela effect. We get Berenstain, Berenstain. We get these alternate re universes born from the base reality all the time, just like these cells splitting. So... When, when a pole shift happened, you, you probably wouldn't even know it. The concept of a, the pole is the central nervous system. We exist in one of these universes consciously at any given time. But when they split, it's like you got a choice to make. It's, it's the choice we making in our world now, what they calling, do you want to go to heaven or hell? And that's basically two universes right. are being born from this one now. They're creating man-made universes. And then if you actually die a natural death, you're literally going traveling back to the base reality and going inward versus continuing to reinvent the simulation and the sin, the ultimate sin, which is this simulation we're supposed to be getting out of. And all every time these cells split, that represent when a society of people awaken to their uh, knowledge of the simulation. Because we know if we live in a simulation, it's only a matter of time for the people in a simulation build their simulation inside of a simulation. And it just goes into this bottomless pit of simulations and simulations, which is how we get the multiverse. Uh, and it looked like just cell splitting. Uh so that's what this CERN. Uh, 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 yeah, that, that's 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 a. Oh, I'm, I'm passionate about that uh topic right there. That, but I'm a fall yeah, back right I there. Was, yeah. I, I, I want to say this though. Um, 
uh, Jason, I, I think, I mean, I, I remember, I recall you um saying that the Phoenix discriminate, but it's also neutral at the same time. And so people in spirit of other, but it's not based, it doesn't have no opinion of the people or it just does that. Just, I mean, how, I mean, how does it discriminate if it does when, whenever it occurs? Every this is dear to your God. Okay. Okay. Well, discrimination can be done in multiple different ways. If you if you're vibrating at a certain frequency and its in its detection ability is only for a certain frequency range, it has nothing to do with good and evil. It's strictly utilitarian. It has been targeted to eliminate certain frequencies. So when it pass when it passes through our reality, that's what happens. And the after effect is strictly utilitarian. It had it didn't do it for evil purposes. It didn't do it for good purposes. It did it because it has a programmed function. And the victims were were basically in the the range that was to be detected. Yeah, yeah. So, so is that something like that's what happened in Egypt? Salutes, my Egypt. brother. Uh, like salutes, Dean General. Yeah, I'm gonna get you some, in. Yeah, is that something similar? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm breaking into what Sanchez is saying. My bad. No, you got it. The floor is yours. You speaking to Jason? You got it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I cut into the shout out. Yeah, you were shouting out people. So that was wrong with me. No, no, I'm no, saying, no. Is that similar to like? Oh, okay. Dean was yeah. letting that me know to... <laughs> that he's been waiting. Like you skip, you basically was in. You you know he's been waiting for a while, but you got it, man. I'm gonna let you finish it. Oh, man. I'm adding this part. This won't even be a question. I just want to. I mean, just to understand what Jason said there. So it's kind of like what I mean, whether you believe or not, what happened with the uh, Israelites in Egypt, how the Death Angel only went to certain doors that didn't have the um. What 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 was it on? I mean, was I mean that's similar to like the Phoenix. It was detecting certain things, though. Whether I mean, but it had no intention. I mean, it had no. Uh, uh, what I mean, you you mentioned the word. I mean, it it wasn't for good or bad. It. I'm gonna give it, you an it example. It goes based on detection. It goes based on detection, like you're saying. That that's right, that's well, what it is. wasn't biased. But there's been many it's times. It's unbiased. Yeah. Okay, look, there's been many times that the knowledge of the Phoenix was weaponized. It was used for military purposes during invasions, during defenses, and I've documented these. But when it comes to the Exodus story, to me, it sounds more like what from you know, using your example of the Exodus, it could be it could have been intel it could have been totally an intelligence op. Let me explain. If a certain people know that a certain phenomenon is about to occur and it only and it only affects those who are vibrating on a frequency of intense fear and it comes through and eliminates only them but those who aren't are fearful uh they know they're immune and therefore they are immune and if this phenomenon comes through they could leak to the public hey guys uh, uh angel of death about to come through and it's going to kill every firstborn son even though that what it wasn't going to do that but because now the word has been spread out that every firstborn son is going to die as soon as this thing appears in the sky, all these firstborn sons are scared. And now all the families are scared who have a firstborn son. And they have now created a phenomenon. It's just like what the media does today. The media literally causes things to happen by speaking them into existence. So this all. Uh, the, the Phoenix may not have targeted certain individuals, but because these individuals have been groomed to believe that they were going to be targeted, therefore they were. Hey, and I'm, yeah, I'm gonna that, say I'm gonna say this too, sense. right? Um, when the Phoenix ph phenomena happened, the aurora borealis was seen worldwide. The aurora borealis is what we're calling the Northern Lights. That means that the North Pole reciprocates it's a reciprocating hyperbole or i mean like how we inhale and exhale but it does it over thousands of years so when it's breathing in and out like your stomach getting big and small the aurora borealis stretches out through the whole world and when this energy passes through everything what is what is what is is neutral energy coming from the pole is reset energy meaning it ain't uh, good or bad, it's just there to wipe the slate clean so that you can decide good or bad with no no bias influence from the, for example, everything we use in our world is electricity based. When these events happen, all the electrical grid go out. 
So that's a time for it's forcing you to go into darkness. Technology cripples the world after so many generations uh, are born under very advanced technological systems. They get dumber and dumber. And what happens is the devices get smarter and smarter. So you have smartphones and dumb people. So it's like a built in mechanism where nature is saying, you know what, just reset everything. Boom. It's it's a predictable event too and it's basically like a chalkboard just being erased if good and bad is written on the chalkboard the energy that's erasing the board ain't dealing with neither one it's just dealing with reset let's start up fresh freshness you know what i'm saying so uh that's yeah th- so, i agree and i hello. understand i appreciate this I- uh, bro sanchez I- and uh jason Br- Bashir, I'm out of here, though, man. I hey, yeah, man. This good, was a good show. Good questions, man. It's good always question. a classic with, with Jason, man. I swear. Hey, uh, Dean, salutes. Yep. You, no longer keeping you salute. waiting, brother. You That's got it. Ticket, you got man. it. No, no I, I have a question in the last hour. I think it's the same. Salutes to the panel. Salutes to Jason. Yeah. How you doing? What's up? What's up? Um, no, it, it, um, no, I was thinking of Thanos. Everybody familiar with Thanos, right? Yeah, uh-huh. the, magnetism. The character. Yeah, he's like the modern basically, Thor. Basically, Thanos' whole premise was to equal out the Earth. It seemed like the construct had Thanos' theory. If everybody familiar with what Thanos' premise was when he got the, um, all the um, Philosopher's Stones, I think he had to collect. But his whole premise was based on, it sounded like he was the construct. It's crazy because eras, the word eras, E-R-A-S, the th- the t- this reset time, it's the word erase too in, in so many ways. But I don't want to be too etymological here. Um, anybody got any questions, though, for Jason specifically as far as the Phenom go? Uh, Phenom, I've, never Phenom, seen, Phenom. I've never seen the, the movie he's talking about, Thanos. I don't yeah. know anything about it. Me neither. I, I a, just know the it's character. A Marvel, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a Marvel character. He basically was deducing when you was talking about sacrifice someone you love for the greater good. In the Thanos theory, he sacrificed his daughter. He, he basically, he wanted to basically eliminate half the population of the earth for the greater good of the other half. So it just seems like, you know, based on his theology, me and my friends argue. Some people like him. They was like, "Yeah, he right," but he's basically a mass murderer. If you depending on, he's a liberator on one spectrum and a terrorist on another spectrum, depending on what side of the spectrum you're looking at. So it just seemed like you said the construct doesn't make a choice. It just That's what Thanos was doing. It wasn't good or evil. He was just making a choice. So yeah, I found that it's a Marvel thing. That was the like the, the like the biggest okay. last Marvel. Well, I, I mean, yes. I don't know anything about it. I haven't seen the movie, but it sounds like to no, me, no, if no, that's no. the situation, if that's the situation, then it sounds like to me in that paradigm that was being for, that was being produced by the that artist or oh, that writer. It sounds to me that in their concept. Every reset can only start with a limited number of souls. They can begin multiplying after the reset, but when the reset first happens, uh, there has to be a culling. There has to be a harvest, and that is kind of very that is kind of associated with the Phoenix phenomenon. Got you. Thank you, sir. It kind of make me think if this phenomena comes to get rid of the soulless NPCs and the meek inherits the earth, the people that. The people that's been uh, like some sort of cosmic justice going on, all the souls that's been damned in this simulation for generations behind these Arconian royal families that's been keeping them dumbed down, spiritually slaves, not just bo- b- the body, you know, um, reincarnating on the false gods and all of this stuff. Um, if that's that's a theory, though, I'm just saying that uh, maybe. This whole force, because the North Pole is this plus sign that they give you for Christ. And they said, Christ said, I am the light. You know, the light of the northern lights. And then you think about Christ keep coming to the earth 
and coming back to the earth during different ages, just like the northern lights expanding and causing these resets uh, that we call in the Carrington event, Phoenix phenomena, all of that stuff. It's the same thing about, hey, when the cataclysm came, we see the northern lights all around the world. You know what I'm saying? But yes, yeah, so that's why I think it's a flood of this northern light energy of magnetism. Uh, but yeah, anybody else, man, these are good questions y'all got. And Jason, man, you just, if you got any uh, images you want me to pull up or whatever in relation to what they saying for you to respond, that's cool too, man. I don't know how much time, you know, you got, but salutes to the panel. Eric Deep, what's good, bro? And Charlie, man, I see you, my brother Charlie. Salutes uh, to everybody. Hey, salutes, Los Angeles. Salutes. Thank salutes. y'all for coming. Might, mm -hmm. May I um, make a question to, actually, to both of you? Yeah, he, Jason can go first. Uh, I'm going to mute up. You got it. All right. I wanted to know if Jason knows, um, is familiar with cymatics. Uh, and how can this like be related to to the structure of reality? So the question is actually for both, uh, especially for Jason, if he finds anything in the in the written record about it, or something that is that that um, that could be like the equivalent. I mean, like we know that a lot of shapes from the from the windows of cathedrals or uh, churches. They display very similar patterns to to cymatics frequencies. Well, I'm familiar with cymatics only to the extent of what's what's very very basically known to the public. I have not delved deep into it. I have not researched it. Um, I've seen some of the experiments using sound and using frequency to create patterns in water, and I and I, and I am vaguely familiar with the research of the Japanese doctor who put out all that phenomenal research on how all. Uh, how water can be charged and programmed according to emotional input. Masaru uh, Emoto. Yeah, Emoto. Yeah, that, that's his name. So, so this is not my area of expertise at all. So no, but what I can tell you is that the patterning that you're, you're talking about in cymatics is virtually identical to the chronological patterns that I have found all throughout world history. And this is why I'm convinced that history is background programming. And this is why I find such a great a fascination with studying it and showing my own listeners all these amazing patterns in pi and phi and curvature equations that are all found all throughout the chronological record. They don't make sense. So in a sense, even the palindromic nature of our, our world timelines that we have been experiencing and we've been flowing through, to, to in, in a sense, they would be also characterized as cymatics as well. Meaning the actual historical events did not happen. They're background programming to this immortal experience that we're that, that we're enjoying. Because that's all this really is. This is an experience. It's not a reality. And and just and just for for me to now I've done a lot of research on cymatics. I'm fascinated with it because when the Bible starts off, it says, "Let there be light." is sound that's being spoken like when we hear when we see lightning we hear thunder this is called sonoluminescence sound and light together is the foundation of all creation together is what create the hollow spirit that we're in sound when it's when you when you take a tone and compress it into a small space and like a tube you can create a star in a jar that's what Polaris is. That's the seed of the Big Bang. But what this shows that um, sound is the shaper of all things. That's why the God in the Bible had to speak creation into existence. If, if, if he's so powerful, why didn't he just shut up and just that go the world? No, he had to say, let there be this. Let there be that. Because that is science giving us this vibratory aspect of, of nature vibration is a artist in in creation and cymatic shows us that everything down to the pattern that's on a turtle's shell uh we can see in cymatic so we know this what cymatics prove is that there are no random shapes in the universe 
and that everything is a tuned frequency. Your, your, you and your own manifestation. For example, we look at turtle shells and we think that the turtle shell is some unique pattern. It's actually a very common shape in the universe. And when we start to study cymatics, we start to see that everything is the expansion of energy and around a center of magnetism, like I was showing a minute ago. And each of these energy fields manifest in their own way, but they're using the same math. And so when that happens, you get things that are the same and different, the paradox of life. These cymatic wheels that we're looking at, these are basically tones when you play them under, if you take sand and put it on a table and you play D2, it'll form this with the vibrations. The sand grains will turn into these sacred geometrical shapes. I'm gonna show you that real quick, it's, it's so dope. These are grains of sand and all we do, we just throw some sand on the table and we play a certain tone and all of the sand grains order themselves in these sacred geometrical patterns that we see on the human skin, snake skin, and all of this stuff. This proves that there's no randomness to the universe. And we can even see how all of the magnetic ley lines goes to the North Pole on, 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 on these. Like how all of the magnetic lines goes to the black cube. Or like looking at a pyramid from a top-down view. So it's a fractal code. That's what holography is. If we say we in a holographic simulation, if you cut any piece of the thing, that little piece look like the whole thing. And that is, uh, let me show you something, because when we get, and I'm going to end with this. They give you this because I, I came up looking at stuff like this. And what they're really trying to show us is cymatics. They're trying to show us different universes created based upon vibration, the spiral of the Fibonacci spiral, spiral of life. If you play, uh, you know what? Let me stop right there because I don't want to be too long-winded with my answers. But remember that the root word of cymatics is Sam, and we live in a simulation. So um, let's go ahead and, and go to the next caller. Thanks for these five questions, man. Y'all the best community out there for real man rk it's flat hey, power baby for real very good bro such is very good if i could take the time real quick to uh kind of give a little bit about what you're saying yeah for sure it's uh true true facts man just to share you know let's go back hey, hey jason uh, big ups guys on the panel um big in revelations in the scriptures um immediately when john you know goes into you know it, 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 he, everything that's going on in heaven and in, in the in revelation is all about noise, sound and noise. Every time there's trumpets and the sound of the trumpets, boom, noise, noise, noise. When we get to chapter eight, in chapter eight, the beginning it says, and, and there was no noise for the period of about a half an hour. Silence. And, and this silence is, is so deafening because after you've been in a rock concert or somewhere with all this noise, even in silence, it's deafening, you know, for about 30 minutes, man. That, that is some awesome stuff. Thanks, San Sanchez, for saying that. Uh, uh, I fall back. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming up today uh, to support. Make sure, man, if y'all ain't sub to uh, Jason's channel on my side, y'all sub up. Moderators, please be putting the link in the chat throughout the show. Any anybody else on the call uh, for, with questions? I'm gonna drop the link again too. I just I just got I want to add you, uh, Bro Sanchez. If you could check uh, a link that I gonna that I just posted in the in the chat. It's a whole book about this uh, theory, basically that uh, frequency is the structure of reality. And you, that you're a musician, you, you, I think you, you're gonna have a lot of fun, though. Can you repost it? Cause uh, yeah, I don't see it in the meet in the meeting chat, and yeah, we can yeah. Yeah, I put it in the in the meeting chat. Oh, ah, okay, no, sorry, I was answering to somebody. I put it in the main one right now. Yeah, Thanks. you wrote it to me. <laughs> cool. Yes, yeah, salutes to everybody. Do we what what do we have? Um 
we have we got a lot of people on the call. We want to make sure everybody get their questions in. While the floor is open, we're going to go to the next caller. Yeah, Jay, Jay Santos had his hand on for a while. Jay Santos, I'll, I'll so, go. Sorry about that, Jay Santos. Uh, you could go ahead and unmute your mic, Jay Santos. You got the floor. No, you guys go ahead. I got my question off earlier. I'm sorry. I forgot okay. to lower my hand. There's somebody else who hasn't asked a question. Go on. Um, okay. Question. Salutes my but sister, Alexis. You got it. Peace and love. Salute Sanchez. Salute to everybody on the panel. Um, oh, I um, just said it right there. Um, so I was just trying to understand the sewing machine a little more. It's a, so do you, are you saying that the CERN machine, they're using it to basically make this multidimensional um, reality or they're using that to travel to other realities and possibly colonize them? Um, or... that, there's these huge computers and shout out to D. Murphy, Dave Murphy. I met him in person. He just done a recent upload of how God made the universe. They and, and it shows that they got these huge computers that's using some sort of pulsation technology to power them. If you stand next to them, it sound is eerie. It's like a human heartbeat. And the man who was working on them said that it's the most crazy experience to work near these computers because it's almost like you're you're working next to a live deity. This was his words. The name of the computers was called Daemons, but that sound a lot like demons. They were black cubes. It's crazy because um, um, what they found out with these advanced computers is that they can uh, actually create certain algorithms and certain patterns that can enter, that can create events in the main in 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 reality uh, and this is not me making this up go watch the upload you got the scientists saying this stuff you got the stuff they making computers that can literally alter time and reality so if cern is a is is the expansion of a big supercomputer right and they're telling us that the end goal of cern is for them to recreate the big bang what well, a big bang is a tear through the very fabric of reality the original big bang is at the north pole so matter of fact let me sh just share something real and jason at any moment you want to cut in you know i'll just be quiet and you you take the mic because you know what i'm saying we definitely want to hear uh from you on this i'm one. good bro i'm good i'm yeah. listening Cause I know they asking about this CERN thing, and that's probably some some other stuff for you. But this, you know, if you look at a break in glass, the pattern that's made here is what we see on a flat Earth AE map with all the magnetic ley line. Look, all of these cymatic shapes. If you take, if if I broke a glass. A, a infinite amount of times I will create each one of these wheels shape. Ain't no random shape is what I'm saying. You know why? It can't be random shapes in a simulation. A simulation is like a video game. If I'm playing Grand Theft Auto, if I walk up to a window and Grand Theft Auto and punch it, it's going to break. Now, the gamer put probably a hundred different patterns that if I pluck, if I hit that window... I'm going to get one of those hundred patterns. So if I hit that wonder enough, I'm going to start seeing the patterns repeat themselves and realize ain't nothing random. That's what the cymatic wheels are when I start seeing these different so-called random shapes reappear. But the thing is, that's in a simulation. That will be true in a simulation that no pattern would be random It'll be already pre-programmed in there, and it's based upon which random one you hit. So if you literally uh, break a window, the pattern's going to be predictable. And it's going to often always resemble what happened when the first break or explosion energy uh, that created reality happened. This is as above, so below. Like when I show this AE map, that refers to like the broken window. But all of this is CERN. With CERN, what they do, they open up a portal and they are able to um, basically split reality in half. CERN is creating a big ass beam, right? 
And I'm going to just simplify what it is and move on. If you look at Star Wars, Darth Vader, his, his planet or his starship will take it will emit this death beam and it'll blow your planet to smithereens. And everybody that was on your ship will now have to go aboard Darth Vader's ship and now because y'all floating without the planet and now you, you slaves. You, you, in his ship. So my thing is this: the death beam is literally what CERN is. CERN the, is a hadron collider. The word hadron come from hydra, the serpent, the se- serpent deity, and that is dealing with energy flowing in the form of a sine wave. I'm gonna show you this, and I'm gonna go ahead and start wrapping this up because CERN is a is an intricate one, but the they want to recreate the Big Bang, which is a, the most focused beam of light in reality. And this is basically the beam stalk. This is the North Pole. This is what's happening on your spinal cord, central nervous system, with, this, with the, how we're wired up and down to the brain stalk, Jack's beam stalk, the Jedi power, all that. They're, so they're going to, if they're able to create a focused amount of energy that's higher than what's at the North Pole, We'll have a pole shift right there. At that point, when they get this thing accelerate to enough in, uh, energy to rival what's happening at the North Pole, it'll be like uh, uh, two hurricanes in the ocean, right? If you're in the ocean, you're going to get sucked into the biggest hurricane, not the little one. If you got a little hurricane next to a big one, you're going to get sucked into the biggest one. So they're trying to create enough of this vortex energy that's actually the same size as the one that's the North Pole. When that happened, our compasses won't know where to point. They won't know whether to point to the true North Pole or Brussels, Belgium. Now, what I think is if we actually go to the North Pole, you still won't be at Mount Maru or the real North Pole. I think you will actually come out of a portal that'll lead you into some sort of machine in ancient Egypt, ancient Samaria somewhere. And then from there, you would have to find the North Pole in that simulation. And when you get there, that ain't going to be true North. You're going to go that seven times before you get to the real, what they call in true North. Because what happened was every time we create a machine like what they doing with CERN, our compass is point in a, in a false direction other than the true center. This is just my theory, though. But, but this is what they saying, though. They're trying to recreate it. And if you look at CERN, it actually resembles the entire flat Earth cosmology. Here go your AE map with the magnetic ley lines coming toward the center. You got the uh, two particles that they're accelerating, which is the sun and moon. And they are, 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 are doing it in the same motion that I just showed what the sun is doing in the sky because that's the best path of energy. Once, that, once those two particles reach the top of the pyramid, guess what happened? They crash together and they create this pattern that we see at the top of this pyramid. That's what they're trying to reduplicate at CERN. And so um, it's like if you think of, all of the uh, wind coming into one area, you got all of these winds coming from all different directions and they crash in one spot, it'll create a tornado right there. But if you got a pyramid in that area, all of that wind will slow down because it'll have to run up the side of the wall of the pyramid like a ramp. And then it'll actually make the energy turn into a reverse itself into an electromagnetic, into like a, a torus field, a vortex pattern like what we see here. So if we see a lot of these monuments on the earth in certain areas to in these, these huge magnetic points, crossroads of energy, in my opinion, if these structures went there, it'll be crazy weather in those areas are like unlivable. Some of this stuff was used to aid the earth and the dis- dispensation of this energy. And they built a lot of structures on grids. But to, to, to make this simple and end here, CERN is basically them reduplicating what, we, what we're in as the Earth because the Earth already has a portal open at the North Pole. 
where all of the magnetic ley lines point to because it's a break. And when you break something, this is what you get, like cutting a fruit open. So this is what CERN is, is, re, is duplicating, this whole magnetic path of light in the hollow sphere and how it all collides at the North Pole to actually tear through the layer of this reality when the two forces collide. And I'm going to fall back right there. So you sound like the synthetic portal, basically. Say that again, it was muffled. You sound like a synthetic portal, basically. Yeah, that's what that's what CERN is, a synthetic version of what's happened at the North Pole. Yep. Okay. Uh if I if I might say, I wanted to to get a clarification uh with Jason with something that uh, you guys were uh sort of uh debating about the appearance of the moon. Uh as far as I I understood uh, following Jason's work. Uh, the moon appears uh, after the vapor canopy collapsed, so it means that it was actually hidden behind that uh, that layer of um, of water in the skies. So it wasn't perceived; the shape wouldn't be perceived. So, so such as when there is uh, clouds, even during the day, you you cannot perceive the sun. Uh, in the back, I mean, like the whole the whole sky is light up, but you cannot actually like uh, like uh, point it out. So the 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 question is is if if I got this right one, and then if um, if basically um, yeah, if I if I got this right, and uh, if if this uh, symbol is older than the first writings that we have, if the yin and yang symbol. It's all this that the first, uh, uh, how to say, uh, writings that we have means that it would come from from before the calendars even starts. Um, then it, it could be it could make sense. I mean, it, you're you're actually saying not really that the moon appear, but actually that the sky did clear, or I misunderstand. Okay, oh, uh, we have to clear. We have to clarify a few things because I I don't know if you've ever been to my channel or if you just got this from this thread right here. I don't. Uh, first no, I've of been all, many times. I've been many many times in your channel. Though. Okay, well you got well you got something totally inverted. One, forty thirty nine BC, the first appearance of the moon in like Emmanuel Velikovsky, he calls this the capture flood. This was before the appearance of the vapor canopy and before that that later vapor canopy collapsed in 2239 bc what we call the flood of noah that's so, uh so that that's you got them backwards you for some reason you totally inverted that history and second uh i don't know anything about the yin yang being old i don't that was that was bro, bro sanchez brought that to your attention that uh all i did was bring to the attention that from well i haven't found anything in my chronological research that goes against the anthropological position, which is rare because I never agree with uniformitarians, but when it comes to the advent of writing, it's pretty much universally known that the first scripts all appeared around the 35th century BC. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, you're you're kind of you're kind of mixing things that I, I just don't I don't really have a comment on that. I don't. I, there's no way for me to to answer that in the package. No, I, ju I, I, I just thought I I honestly thought uh, that. Uh... That there was this uh, this vapor canopy in the sky when it came down. Then it's when like people managed to see the moon and the sun. Like this is what I understand. Then forgive me about like uh, you know. Yeah, well, it's, now, it's a... you know, now you're adding the sun. You didn't add the sun the first time. Now you're adding the sun, which I agree with. I mean, the Sumerian pantheon was very old, but when the great flood happened, they added a new god. At the end of Sumerian history, they add a new god. That new god is Ututhamash, which is the sun. Egypt did the same thing. They already had the Aeneid. The Aeneid was anciently established. But as soon as the great flood happens, the Egyptians add a new sun, call him Horus. So they add a new god called Horus, the sun. So we see. Uh, I agree with you. The sun did appear. This is the same thing. The Zapotec, the Toltec, the Quiche, the Aymara, the Olmecs, the Mayan. This is the exact same thing they had. They had the four sun ages. These are the sun calendar systems. But the very first sun was the water sun. And the reason for that was because once the sky fell, 
and the vapor ca canopy was gone, they saw the sun. There it was. This began the ancient American calendrical system. So, yeah, once you introduce the sun, I agree with you 100%. It was a collapse of the vapor canopy that began all that. But when you're Yo, talking you, about you don't need you don't need to agree you don't need to agree yeah, with me because I know this just because of you. <laughs> and, and, and and you know what? And another thing to keep in mind with them changing uh the deity to sun gods after a certain time. Before these sun gods and solar calendars, they was actually on lunar calendars worshiping lunar gods. So that's something interesting too. I was doing research on the calendars and found out some of the oldest calendars. One of them had 360 days in a year. And that sounds about right because if, if to say that the heavens is designed perfect, no blasphemy. God is a perfect mathematician, right? We're on a circle of the earth, like the Bible said. A circle is 360 degrees. Technically, you probably should have 360 days in a year. And then you wouldn't need a leap year to account for you adding like Augustus, January. It's, I don't even like we know we ain't on the right time right now. But uh, I think these are interesting questions. I'm going to keep the uh, floor open. Uh, so just to just to. To make it clear, to to so we can look, so we can visualize it well. Then, uh, you're you're saying, Jason, that the moon was there before the vapor canopy, right? And the uh, and you could see it at night basically, but the sun you could not see it because it was some sort of like spread out, um, sort of, sort of like when we have clouds and there was this like red light. You talk about like a red light. Also, that red light, uh, it was it, it was because that water had also dirt in the sky or something like this. Okay. Um, yeah, you you might need to watch some of my vapor canopy videos. You have you have a, <laughs> a very distilled notion. Oh, listen, it, it, it's very clear from the five books on vapor canopy by scientists that I have quoted extensively. The the vapor canopy, the moon, the moon has never disappeared because a vapor canopy actually becomes clear at night. That's when that's when the world cools and all that moisture, that humidity drops to the ground. And this is what you find in the book of Genesis. Genesis is very clear. Before the flood, there was no rain. The water every evening and every morning, the water, the water literally dropped from the sky and it wasn't rain it was dew it was condensation and it, it watered all the plants it, it created pools for for animals to drink out of it was like a garden of eden type scenario where fruit and, and, and vegetables everything was available uh so this during the vapor canopy the moon was actually magnified it was much larger in the sky because a vapor canopy is a mesosphere we still have the mesosphere up there now and it's still packed with water droplets it just doesn't have all the moisture anymore because all that all that moisture that used to be suspended up there before the day the sky fell is now is now at your polar extremities in the form of fresh water ice that has been built up 2 miles high at the north and south poles so, so for, those, for, those, for those who don't know, it does hard, it hardly even snows at the North and South Pole. And this is the reason for this is there's no humidity in those areas of the world. And this is a problem for the Ice Age theory. This is right now, you can Google this. There are 60 independent theories as to how an Ice Age is even possible. The reason there's 60 different ones is because of the humidity factor. They can't figure out how that much ice pack got there because they have never taken into consideration that it all happened almost instantly as soon as the day the sky fell. But when it came, when it came to the collapse of the vapor canopy, the moon was no longer magnified at night. Now it looked far away to the ancient mindset. That means it lost power. And because it was associated to the goddess, it means the goddess lost power. So now that the vapor canopy is gone during the daytime, the sun can be clearly seen because when the sun was passing over the sky during a vapor canopy, it could not be seen. But that heat is what thickened the canopy and caused that obscurity. Like the Native American said, it was the time of spider grandmother. She had her web across the sky. The web didn't trap the moon, but it did trap the sun. 
and the, and the web watered the whole world. It was the time of the dark purple light. And animals and, and animals and people grew to big sizes. It was all there. But the moon was never stopped by the vapor canopy. The moon, the moon was actually benefited. It was magnified at night because the whole sky was like a magnifying lens. And the moon was just huge. But in the daytime, the daytime was actually dark. You know, this is why we have it inverted today. Anybody who has studied the old Bronze Age institutions of Babylon and the old Israelite calendars, you will find out that the beginning of the day is our nighttime now. The evening and the morning was the first day. Anybody who has studied the Jewish calendar will tell you that even today, the Jews regard the beginning of the day as sundown. Why is that? The reason is, is because in the ancient world, it was, it was more light during the night than there was at day. Daytime shuts you down because it was extreme heat conditions. Nobody wants to do anything but just lay around and, and try to cool off uh, under the vapor canopy. And at nighttime, it cooled. There was moisture, and you could clearly see everything. And it looked in, in, the, in the sky looked so close. Even the ancients said they could go go they could go walk up hills, and it felt felt like they could they could touch and sing to the stars. Yeah, this is a totally different world than we're experiencing today. But these ancient institutions are still viable. They're still regarded today, just like the Jewish calendar today still regards sundown as the beginning of the day. And that's because before the sky fell, that was the beginning of the day. That's when you started moving around. It was nice and cool. And you could see clearly we were night creatures at that time because that's when all the light was. The moon lit the entire world up. The moon was the symbol of the goddess. People were goddess, cultures were goddess worshiping. The patriarchy only happened and, and grew up and matured and took over when the when the sky fell and the moon went small and the sun was a burning disc across the sky. So this is a this is this is the this is you, you might be confusing a, a couple things, but overall you pretty much got it. And and I just want to say this too, right? To 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 piggyback on this uh, question you asked. See, the thing about them worshiping the goddess before the gods, why they had matriarchal systems before patriarchal systems. The the goddess represent the moon. The god represent the sun. And we live on a big clock. And the sun is the hour hand. The word hours is the word Horus. That's the masculine. The word man, moon, minutes is the minute hand. But here's the thing. Before the, before the, before the solar and lunar ca uh, cal calendrical systems, before the God and goddess worship, everybody on earth worshiped is something called the great mother. And that's the oldest deity on earth. This great mother God is all over the world. And when they say it ain't over to the fat lady scene, it's this fat. It, uh, exaggerated deity. They say it's obesity worship, but they was personifying the Big Bang as a woman getting fat. This is no joke. And that woman is Mary. The middle of our earth is called Maru. And it's and they refer to that as this dark hole was giving birth to the light of our simulation out of a magnet. And they personified that as a place of conception. You know, women give birth. Our universe wasn't created. It was conceived, basically. So you see the baby sitting on Mary's lap. Her name was Center before they turned it to Santa. When they got the children sitting on Santa's lap, before it was a male deity, it was a female deity that we sat on her lap like this shows. And this represent the Kaaba cube. This represent the portal of creation. So Mary is Maru. It represent this hole at the middle of the earth. And uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, time is being created from that point. So uh, for whatever is worth to your uh, question, I think it was a good one. So we'll we'll stop there with that. You got it. Next person. Y'all got some good ones. Hey, I got a question for you, Jason. I'm right here. Hello? Listen. Hey, Jason, is the Phoenix Jesus? Uh, the early so Christian... So he's going to return. I'm sorry, not to I apologize. Not oh, it's, speaking it... on his return. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good association. I don't believe Jesus was an actual person walking around doing all those things. The early Christian church, 
which their earliest records were 175 AD. They made the associations early on to Phoenix and the Jesus and Jesus. Jesus is depicted as the Phoenix in a lot of alchemical threat. Uh, credits that I just showed one an alchemical video the other day where it specifically sh shows the word Jesus in Greek uh, uh, in juxtaposition to the Phoenix. So uh, the connection is real in, in, in the human mindset, but um, there's a deeper connection. And that deeper connection is not something we can really go into a lot of depth in this de in, in this video because it took me three, it took me three hours and 48 minutes the other night just to get it basically get to outline it and that is the fact that jesus is the sum of 16 ancient crucified saviors that were all solar symbols this is the research of cursey graves a hundred years ago of 130 years ago of of uh, well actually 150 years ago of gerald massey in the 1880s and many others before them uh, oh yeah albert t clay there's a there's a lot of them that associated the the 16 cru crucified gods in history jesus is was the was basically the last one he was he was the mithras turned mithras turned into the the gnostic version of our savior and this uh yes the yes this is a the phoenix story about the return of god and all that the darkening of the sun this is why that passage was put in matthew mark and luke about when Jesus was crucified, the sun darkened and there was a great earthquake and all that. That's part of the Phoenix phenomenon. But the Phoenix phenomenon did not happen in 33 AD. The very fact that it's 33 AD just shows you who, who orchestrated and created that mythos because it's not historical. We have, we have the actual records of over 18 different authors who are alive in the first century and none of them mention those events. Two of them were Seneca and Pliny the Elder, and both of those, both of those men meticulously documented every single eclipse during their lifetimes. Nothing like that happened that's mentioned in the in the in the gospels, because those gospels weren't written for 150 more years. But uh yeah, the the this this is a massive amount of deception that that got that went into the creation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A massive amount. And the chronology attached to it is 100 percent Freemasonic. It's a it's the reason why the sun god was crucified at 33 at the 33rd year. You can regard that as in the 33rd degree the sun went dark. And and what's so interesting about the phoenix, it is a deity and whenever we talk about the phoenix, we literally got to talk about that deity if we really want to understand it because if you look up the phoenix goddess, that she I see why he asked was that Christ because the Phoenix goddess comes in the same pose as Christ. I'm going to show it to you. But when I was bringing up the, uh, the great mother goddess, right? This is the same deity. This, if you ever look at an Indian totem pole, they got this bird at the top of all the totem poles. That's the Phoenix. What that represent? That represent the light of the aurora borealis bursting out the top of the firmament dome. I can show it to you right here in the Mayan cosmology. When they talked about speaking of Jesus, right in Jesus' story, you got a bird landing on the cross. Where did they get that from? Right here in Mesoamerica, you can see the sacred bird Itzamana, a bird of heaven, landing on the world tree. And this is that world tree represents this volcano that I'm talking about. Out of that volcano, fire is coming out. And the fire that's coming out of the volcano is the phoenix bird with its red wings and red bright fire. It's the fire at the top of Maru that's coming out. And that's why this totem pole, this to this bird is always at the top of the totem pole, symbolizing the, the, when we get our wings, basically, as spirits, and we lead a simulation. If even if like you the pull up, sign? It, even yeah, like the medical sign, you can go there. Look at this symbol here. Yeah. This this from Samaria. Look, they got a guy being born from the tree of life. The simulation is pillar. Remember, Jason said a word. Pyramid is pillar. The the root word of pillar is pile. It's dealing with a pile of rocks like an ant bed. They're piling dirt, and it's going to make this triangle shape. But the thing is, at the top, just like a volcano in, in the middle of our earth, this is what allows our consciousness to exit the central nervous system. This tree of life is our spinal cord, the central nervous system, the spinal cord all the way up to the brain stalk to the seat of the soul. 
And once the consciousness rise out of the body, we lead the earth. You can't lead the earth without leaving the body. This is, this is what's got us in the earth. And it, so you leave in the body, you leave in the earth like in a dream. And so this, this artwork is very deep. This shows you why the bird is mounted at the top of the dome, uh, symbolizing, you know, the soul leaving. The, like this is the top of your head, basically. This, this firmament don't got the word meant in it because it's talking about the mind. If you pull up the universe and you pull up the mind, they look the same. Like I said, if you was dreaming and I walked up to you in a dream and I told you, hey, man, you created this universe, you'll laugh at me until you wake up in your bed and realize, yes, you're inside of your own mind. We're all in our own universes. And when we connect them all together, we create the universe, just like connecting online to play Call of Duty. We all got our own game that we can play alone, but we could go online and we online now. So when we, we really looking at our external organs, when we look up at the heavens and the way that the seven wandering stars are moving, this was called your chakra chakras. These are, you got internal organs, external organs. And my thing is it, the organs don't stop out to the skin. They expand way out to the stars. This is how astrology is born because when they study what's going on in the heavens, they know what's going on in the human being. This gave birth to the concept of as above, so below. So literally the universe, when we say that the universe is the mind of God and that what ancient science that say God is just man asleep, that's true. When God fall asleep and dream, life is but a dream. When God wake up, the dream is over. So the universe, the brain cell is all a fractal code. There is no physicality. It's just thought power. It's all happening in, with pure mind. And, and in our mind, in the darkness of our mind, thoughts are the holographic light images that's born out of the darkness, just like the universe we're in. So this is, this is, it shows us how important we are, how sacred we are. People was put to death for saying, I'm God. I created the universe. Blasphemy! Because they wanted to hide this knowledge. I said proudly today. You know, and, and as crazy as you sound, Jesus said it, ye are gods. And they put him to death for saying the same thing. This was the real true knowledge right here, you know, of how we're creating the outside from the inside. But I'm going to fall back right there. Oh, so, yo, sorry, I need to bring out this. I think it's, uh, it's I, I'm not going to have a chance again to ever bring out this. And, and I think it could be really interesting. Again, for both, I called a, a while ago. I bring uh, up the subject of Al Aksar, the the Golden Dome. Uh, I wanted to know if Jason has any, has any knowledge on the subject that uh, so allegedly this uh, the Jewish people they need to build the third temple in the same complex where right now is like the the mosque, which is like the third most important mosque, uh, the Golden the Golden Dome mosque, and that allegedly. Uh, Mohammed ascended to, I don't know exactly where he ascended. I mean, if we could, if we could also like uh, go a little bit deeper on this concept that Mohammed allegedly ascended from this place, and also the Messiah needs to come back from this place as well. Um, I wanted to know if you, both of you, any one of uh, has any insight in the in the subject, though. Oh, this this is not this is not anything for me to discuss on YouTube. Uh, you're you're asking you're asking me about the Jewish temple, and almost anything that I talk about on that is going to be something yeah. that triggers a lot of people. And yeah. Uh, I am yeah, I'm I'm the wrong person to ask yeah. that on somebody else's channel because I'm not yeah. going to draw that type of attention to to Bro Sanchez's channel. And I appreciate you, Jason. That's a good catch because that's a good way to get this video. It, well, well you kind of walking on thin ice with that you know so, yeah i'm so i'm sorry if i i'm sorry if i uh, if it was a, like a taboo taboo i just wanted to it's know fine. If it's fine it's fine we can we could just move on to the next point anybody else oh yeah ross we can't hear you though 
21 Truth. We got iPhone, whoever else want, and JT, welcome back. Pierre, <laughs> Pierre. Yeah, guys. Yeah, Jason, we're, uh, we're, what's the, the Phoenix event, you know, with uh, 2040 and 2046? Um, where in Asia do you say it uh, will hit the worst and stuff like that? I heard you mention something about it, but I, I, I was wondering about the Philippines too and that area. Oh, uh, well, 20, 2040, 2040 doesn't look good for Asia at all. And the Philippines are very close to Asia, but they're actually between Asia and what, Australia, right? Am I am I correct about that? That I don't even know myself right now. <laughs> can, I, oh. can I say something real quick, though? I thought about this. Now, Jason is an expert at, you know, the Phoenix events in chronological order at and all of that. So I don't know much about that, but so he can correct me if I'm wrong on this. But my I have a theory that all of these Phoenix resets are basically what they call in Big Bangs, and they symbolize every time our universe was destroyed and recreated. Even the one with Noah and this gives birth to Mandela effects. When 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 I say base reality, I'm saying that the world we're in right now is not the base reality. And that deja vu is proof of that because the, the, we ain't on real time. We're like in a universe with a lag. That's all everything you fit doing right now. You already did it in a future universe. We're behind, in my opinion. So my thing is like... um. All of these Phoenix e events, when we look around, we say we in a fake simulation, but the base reality is is still out there, right? Or in there, wherever we know this ain't the base reality. This is It could be many of these simulations. But the point is, we look around these simulations and we say that pyramid is old, that pyramid is young, this structure is this old, that one is this old, and I'd be like, yo, this is a brand new simulation, and it's a paradox, meaning that we right and wrong. It means that if if the pyramids around the world are the oldest structures on Earth, I don't think we built them in this simulation. I think we built them in the base world, and that when we start to copy that universe, just like and we copy these structures into, like right now, if we build a fake simulation in a computer. We're going to put the Sphinx in there. We're going to put Giza in there. We're going to put the uh, Eiffel Tower. But if somebody in the computer simulation that we just built, say, how old is the Eiffel Tower? It, we could say it's just a month years old because we just built this world. But the structure is the Eiffel Tower is, is, is almost, you know, it's old as hell. You know, the, the pyramids, we can say are thousands of years old. But if I make a new simulation tomorrow, and I bring everything here, there, people going to think the pyramids in my simulation are that old, but they're referring to the base. You get what I'm saying? Like nothing here is really real or what it appears to be. And far as we know, this sim simulation we in could have just been recently created. You wouldn't know because it'll start at a point in time that's already old. So this paradox of old and new because if i create a brand new simulation right now a lot of the old things are gonna go into this new world but those old things won't be old there it's a brand new geezer a brand new me a brand new avatar brand but we will still have history in that new simulation and this is why when jason was saying like how he think about history and that it's a lot of History is tricky, you know what I'm saying? The Mandela effect plays a role in it. We remember the past, we remember the future. Our memory is very selective as a collective. We edit our memories and what we want to remember at, at time points. If we do that so much as so many people, we may create a Mandela effect where the simulation got to change that shit now. Uh, and now you got this this coincidence or this like paradox of Barristain, Barristain, so to speak. I'm all over the place, but I'm going to just stop right there. I think trying to date things inside of this simulation going to always be tricky. And that's kind of like, I think what you were saying about history being some sort of, um, 
I forgot the word you used, but I'm a, I'm a fall fall back. Yeah, I'm so, so I just put a little picture in the in the chat here in the panel um, to Jason's question with the the position of the countries. I, I guess you can see it from that, you know, one better explain. Why and I mean. That's something I always wondered about, you know. Because I think, like, if we go around the world, uh, I think he was asking, um, you want to rephrase your question again? Yeah, I was just uh, saying, I put a picture in the chat because you mentioned uh, the, the location of the Philippines, and I just put a picture in the chat. It's it's not in English, but you can make out the names. It's just so you can uh, better answer my question with uh, if the Philippines is also going to get hit hard there. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah, you, you, you would need to go to my channel and see and listen to those videos. I'm not, yeah, I'm not to cut you. I need to cut this video short. I need, I got, I got a bathroom scenario building in me and I need to go. Is there you a know, specific you, video where you go a lot into that? It, it would be in my Phoenix playlist. Yeah, that's what I'm on now. I haven't come to that. I had only heard that area, but nothing about uh, that area with the Philippines. That's why I just I, had to ask. I, I, have, I have a search engine on my website. You can type in anything you're curious about, and it will pull up the exact videos where it's located and the timestamps. You click onto it, it'll answer your questions instantly. All right. Cool. Hey, guys, I want to say this. Hey, uh, Jason and uh, Brother Sanchez, man. Man, I, I thought that this video was so important, man. We're in the middle of, uh, uh, of doing a complete plumbing job, man, running cold water and hot water lines, man. And I couldn't miss this video, man. It's dark outside, and we're still pushing hard to get it done. We're finishing up, man, but I had to make sure I tied in this video because you brothers are so genius, man. And, and I appreciate you guys for offering this kind of value for free. You know, and and donation is 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 the most important thing, man. And and but I, I appreciate you guys' time, man. I, I I do want you fellas to know that, man. Um, it it it's 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 part of my diet, man. It's part of my daily diet and routine. So just want you guys to know that, man. Awesome. Uh, uh just appreciate so you know, that. man. Uh, look look at this here, man. Look at this, man. Man, look at this, man. Hard work make winners, man. Hard work make winners, baby. That's what let's go. <laughs> I there appreciate it, fellas. There we go. Appreciate y'all, man. Jason, we appreciate you. Let me turn my camera on. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Both of our communities are intertwined. I think this was an awesome and important bill, just like the brother said. I'm going to let everybody go. We don't want to keep Jason going, y'all. You heard why he said he got to leave, right? Let's let him go, man. Uh, <laughs> Jason, we, we, Jason, we, up, we appreciate up. you, Jason. We're going we're gonna to definitely do it again. Peace and love, Jason. Yo, man, hit that outro. <laughs> Salute, hey, Jason. Hey, 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 um, make sure y'all go ahead over to Archaics, by the way, as well. Now, somebody's screen sharing, and we're closing out. <laughs> yeah, and I that wanted, was the picture. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah we're going to have to cover it on the next one. We got to go ahead and close yeah. out. But, um... Uh, we got because we gotta let Jason go, and make sure y'all head on over to, to to and follow him on his channel, man, for deep research. I learn a lot from Jason, the brothers deep. So we out of here, guys. Peace and much love, and I'll Bless see y'all on on in Jason's chat room on his next stream, uh, or on mine, one or the other. Peace, peace and love to everybody. Salutes, bro. Peace and love, you guys. Peace and love. Yeah. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thank y'all for tuning in. It have been a classic. Uh, we appreciate any and all donations that you choose to uh, give. You can check the video description area for all things Bro Sanchez. If you enjoyed this, let us know in the comment section. Hit the like button. Um, if you guys support the show because we're not monetized by YouTube. Then we'll come back with an encore and do a after party, a after show surrounding these same topics of archaics and flat power after show. All right. So hit the donate button, hit the cash app, 
and uh, we'll come come back, you know, um, with an encore. Peace and much love, guys. See you in the future. Just one.